Hello. I come from a Caribbean family mostly Catholic, but as you all may know in the island's culture, the occult forms part of our religion as well. The women in my family seem to have a special connection and special way of seeing things, since my great-grandmother and I'm sure before her as well. My mother and I used to talk about spirits all the time, and one day I said to her mother, you know I'm very scary. Oh, if you are going to contact me in any way after you die, make sure you do it through my dreams. She laughed and said okay. My mother passed away at the age of 47, still young due to cancer. Almost a year after she died one afternoon, I decided to go home early from work because I did not feel good. When I got home at 3 p.m., I laid down on the sofa and was almost asleep. It was almost like I was asleep in the inside but awake in the inside, and suddenly I saw my mother standing there in front of the sofa, just looking at me smiling, not saying anything. She looked like she used to look when I was little. She had her big sunglasses on like the ones used in the late 70s, and she was giving me two things. One was a triangular rock with a symbol on it, and a red, white, and turquoise feather. At the same time, I knew she was dead but I was crying and trying to reach out for her from the couch. Suddenly I woke up. When my body slammed on the couch, I was suspended on the air. It was a very weird experience. All I could think of was that she wanted to contact me, and she did not want to scare me. But till this day, I don't know the meaning of my dream. I have had several dreams of past relatives that have passed, but this dream was reoccurring. Let me start from the beginning. My father-in-law and brother-in-law were fishermen for many years, and their boat was lost out at sea long before either my now husband were married. My husband, in fact, was in high school at the time. The boat or the bodies were never found. Oh, it left a lot of questions for the family. My husband never got over the guilt of not meeting them at a harbor somewhere down the coastline to make sure they got there. Because before they left, they had to replace the fuel pump. Just keep in mind that even though I and my husband were married, I had never seen a pic of either of them. My mother-in-law kept them packed away. Well, years later of being married to my husband, I started having a dream about a man standing on the shore above the boats. He looked grotesque, and I knew he was not of the living, because his skin was green and slimy looking. He was wearing a black stocking cap, jeans, a flannel and fisherman thick jacket. I would get frightened and wake up. The same dream kept on happening, until finally through fear, I asked him what he wanted. Then suddenly, I was whisked away which felt like an out of body experience, and I was standing on a rock in a hidden alcove along the shore. The tide was out. And there were several of these rocks that were sticking up out of the water. I looked around then down on the rock I was standing on, and I see two skeletons laying on the rock. Next thing I know, they came together and forming two skeletons, in awe and frightened. I started to see their mouths move, but heard nothing in my ears, but heard them speaking in my head. They told me to tell everyone that they are fine and happy and to make sure I told the family to stop wondering, and to move on with their lives, and that one day they will see them again. Next thing I knew, I realized it was my father-in-law and my brother-in-law. After speaking to them and receiving the message, they fell apart and rested on the rock that they were standing, as if they never came together. Heart racing. I was shown path to a trail in order to climb up, and out of the alcove, then halfway up, I awoke. It took me a few days to sort things out and tell my husband what happened. At first, I described the man on the docks, the one with the black stocking hat, jeans, etc. He said that it described his dad the day he left for his final fishing trip. Remember, I had not seen a picture of him yet. I told my husband what he told, that they were okay and happy now. I told him the details of where I was standing, 
and what that alcove looked like. He said the ghost card looked in a spot as described in my dreams, but never found any bodies or the boat. After telling my husband, I've never had a dream like that again. I've always known I helped my husband close a chapter of guilt that had been eating him for years. I believe the main message was for my hubby. I just recently finally got a good picture of my father-in-law, and it was him in my dreams. Just looking at the picture took my breath away. Sorry for the long post, but all that I said is true. This is an absolutely true account of what happened to me, my brother Darren and our friend Lee, at Shipley Road in Loudsboro, UK. We were all sleeping on the floor of my room as Lee was staying over, because our moms were working at the local pub together. It was about 1 a.m., Darren and I were just getting to sleep when we heard the scraping coming from the bedroom of the adjoining house. It was like someone was digging a spike high up into the plaster on the other side then dragging it down in the arc to the floorboards. This would just happen again constantly, to the point where you thought it might actually come through. Like I said, we were awake but Lee, who was sleeping at her feet, was out cold. We tried to wake him by shaking him, but nothing worked. Then the smashing started. It was like a grown man throwing dinner plates at the wall, one after another. Then banging and crashing started. All the time the other noises continued, until it all built up to the crescendo of the noise. The next thing that happened would haunt me even to this day. We heard a very loud, piercing scream. The only way I can describe it is a scream that was in the film Train Spotting. In it, a woman's baby dies in its cut, and when the mother finds that she screams, well, take that scream and times it by a hundred. Lee would still not wake up through all of this, which was strange on its own. Anyway, we were that worried. We got our mother up, who promptly rang the police who arrived shortly after. They could hear all of this from the outside. But with all of their combined efforts to get somebody to the front door, nothing worked. They ended up breaking the door down, and that's when all of this got super spooky. They found nothing. The house was empty, and there was no smash cultery, no mark down the wall, nothing. The police left, and it all started again. This time, Darren and I were terrified, and still Lee would not wake up. We just laid there wide awake waiting for sunrise. When it finally came, as if on cue, the first bird we heard that Sunday morning, all the noises stopped instantly. And at the very same time, Lee woke up, wondering what all the fuss was about. This story is 100% true. Thanks for reading. I live in an old house in Lisbon. We occasionally hear strange noises. One person will hear other people having conversations when no one is around. We also have cold places in the house. On occasion, the living room or the downstairs bedroom will be 4-5 or five degrees colder than the other rooms of the home. And sometimes, my husband claims that he sees strange blurs and movements out of the corner of his eye. If we do have ghosts, I don't feel that any of them are threatening. The other day I was sitting in the living room watching TV, when I swear I heard someone yell from the kitchen. They said I'm waiting, as if someone was in the kitchen, and waiting for someone to finish getting ready to go. And they weren't moving fast enough, and they were getting fed up with waiting. I said what's your problem, because I thought it was my husband getting home from work, and he wanted me to go someplace with him. When I got up to check it out. There was no one in the kitchen, and my husband's motorcycle wasn't in the garage, as he had taken it to work that morning. My kids, 12 and 14, will come down from their rooms and ask us what we wanted, when neither my husband nor I have called them. We have a dog, and she doesn't seem bothered one way or another. My friends and family used to live in an apartment complex called Cape Meadows. 
during our two years of living there, we all experienced a number of unexplained experiences in our building there. There were six units. However, only four were rented and livable. The other two were damaged severely. They were used there for storage of missed items through the years. In my particular apartment, my little girl started doing strange things. She was talking to her closet one night. I asked her who she was talking to, and she said Bobby. I asked her who Bobby was, and she told me he lived out back, by the bushes in the sandbox. Then soon after, my daughter's TV started turning on by itself, even when she wasn't home. We would hear something coming from her bedroom, and when we opened the door, her TV would be on. So I turned it off and closed the door. Sure enough, I heard the noises again and went back to the room. The TV was on again. This happened quite often. Then there was another time. My husband and I were asleep and my daughter was sound asleep. And my husband thought he felt my daughter crawl in bed with us. When he turned over to get her and put her back to bed, she wasn't there. He went in to check in on her, and there she was out like a light. Later that night, our bedroom door slammed open, and we saw what we thought was my little girl running around on our bed. However, there was nobody there again. We got up to check on her again, and the gates in the hallway started rattling, and it was very cold in the hallway in my little girl's room. I checked the thermostat to see if the heat was on, and it was running, and set on like 70 like always, but the temp gauge read 35 degrees. My daughter was still sound asleep. Another incident was my husband was sitting in the living room with the front door wide open. He saw out of the door in the hallway a smoky figure of an old man wearing torn overalls. He turned to me and said, check this out. When he turned back, he was gone. That same night, we went down to our neighbor's apartment and told him what my husband had seen and described the same man sitting in his computer chair. At that time, at that same neighbor's apartment, my family and friends from across the hall were visiting, and on the keychain holder next to the door was a keychain floating in the air, as if someone was taking it off the hook. But you couldn't see anyone. My neighbor said, Hi, Bobby and the keychain fell at my neighbor's apartment below me. She was sleeping one afternoon when her bedroom started knocking back and forth and the door handle was shaking. That's when she thought the wind was circulating through the apartment causing this. But when she got up, on the outside of her door was what looked like little wet handprints, but you couldn't wipe them dry and they never went away. At my other neighbor's apartment, it was a basement apartment, and the two apartments above them were the damaged apartments. But quite frequently, we would hear footsteps and what sounded like people moving furniture up there. These apartments were always locked and never got into by anyone. At my apartment, we would sometimes leave for the weekend and then go to my parents. When we leave, we turned out all the lights except for a lamp in the living room. When we would return home, all the lights would be on, except for the lamp we had left on, and we never locked our deadbolt because we had trusting neighbors. We would only lock the handle lock. However, when we returned, the deadbolt locked every time. I was babysitting my neighbor's daughter one day, and when her parents came to pick her up, we were looking for her shoes she took off in my daughter's bedroom. That's when she pointed to the middle of the floor by the bed where she had left them. But they were not there. We looked under the bed in the closet, all over the apartment. No shoes. I told them I would keep looking. They would turn up somewhere, and I would bring them down when I found them. Oh, they left and went home. I started looking again for her shoes in my daughter's bedroom. And sure enough, they were in the middle of the floor. They were not there ten minutes prior. We had told our landlord about what we had experienced. And that little girl was always talking to this Bobby person. And that she told us he lived out by the bushes next to the sandbox. He told us that in the 70s, 
A little boy about seven years old had drowned in the swimming pool, where the sandbox is now. He said that after the little boy drowned, the pool was filled with dirt and sand was laid out over it. We'll make a sandbox. And the little boy's name was Robert. We experienced a lot of unexplained occurrences here, but none life-threatening. Things happened when I was a very little boy. At the age of four, it started and I had already felt that our house had something particular. Before I knew about the existence of monsters or ghosts, I already was scared in the house. Until my tenth year, I always slept with my mother in the same room. But I never asked for that and I never told about my fear. Because such things go by themselves. One night at about 3 p.m., a big painting fell from the wall with a loud bang. My father couldn't believe it, but yet it happened. In the dark, I spotted that the ceiling corners in the room that we slept in were not always in the same. In one of the four corners, once I spotted something having the shape of a human head with a cap. Other times in that same corner, it was not quite there, and sometimes I could perceive a faint light there if I concentrated painstakingly on that. Another time I couldn't find my mother in the home, although she was there, my father was at work, then seemingly she was nowhere to be seen, until I heard her sitting in the kitchen, and yes, one of the little doors with the sink unit was finger thick opened. I walked towards, opened the door, and there she was sitting, completely together underneath the sink drain. We'll never know what happened there. The only thing my mother cryingly said she had bumped her head. Growing older, I thought to myself, hadn't there been another explanation? But you know as well, that such things are taboo to talk about. After darkfall, I sometimes could hear faint noises on the stairs and on the upper gangway, and some months later again after twilight, a thunder was coming up. There was this huge lightning strike right in front of the house, which was 10 meters in distance, with an indescribable loud blow, which made me promptly dive into bed in the room I was. Later we moved out of the house and now I'm 61, having been returned to my birthplace and I heard that the same house had been standing twice vacant for a long time, and the folks moving in didn't stay for too long. A broker did confirm this to me after telling him. The odd thing is, my fondest wish is to return into the house, but I can't get a mortgage. After moving out of the house, all the things in my life went wrong. Nothing but preventions and hardships. No job, no partner, etc. I think I arrived at the following conclusion. The ghosts in the house were harmless. Quite the contrary. They had been trying to warn me not to leave the house. My name is Helen, and I'm a rational wife and mother of two. I've experienced psychic phenomenon ever since anybody can remember, seeing things almost before I could talk. This is my most recent experience. We moved to our house in 1991. On the moment we moved in, I felt a presence. Occasionally, I would hear footsteps upstairs, light ones like a child running. My mother, when she was alone in the house, would also hear them. After the birth of my first child, my daughter, this increased. When my daughter started to talk, she would come into the night or cry out that Jamie had woken her up to play. Jamie is my niece. Oh, to Evie. Any girl of about three to four years with blonde hair was, was Jamie at that time. I wondered at this, but since she was not afraid, I didn't worry. When I was heavily pregnant with my son, I was resting in the evening. Daughter was asleep, and hubby was out. House was empty. Then I heard her wake up to get out of bed, run along the landing, jump onto the top step and call mama. Thinking it was Evie, I replied, I'm here, dear, expecting her to come in for a cuddle. There was no sound of movement, so I heaved myself off the bed and went to see her. There was nobody there. I looked in her room, and she was tucked up in bed and fast asleep. This happened to me quite often, 
Then after this, I would hear the little girl calling her mom. I went to see a medium and told her. She said the child was lost. And next time I should go to the bottom of the stairs and tell her to go into the light to find her mom. And then I should recite the Lord's Prayer. Well, next time I did this, and since then no more footsteps, but I still occasionally feel like I'm being watched. I hope the child found her mom and is at peace now. Here are a few stories. It may be long, but it's certainly interesting enough to hold your attention. I've encountered many paranormal activities since I was a child. Apparently things like this run in my family, but I seem to be the only one who has held on to my abilities. The first encounter I can recall was in Villa Rica, Georgia. I don't remember how old I was, but I know I was really young. My mother and I were driving to my aunt's house late at night. There was a store of some sort on the side of the road, which looked to be very old. Outside of the door stood a light up frame, which housed advertisements. I noticed a figure moving around it. It had huge white glowing eyes. And the best way I can explain it is by telling you that it reminded me of Spider-Man in the dark. I yelled for my mother to stop the car because the boogeyman was standing right outside the store. She told me I was seeing things. But to this day, she wishes she stopped the car. I saw things throughout my childhood so much that most nights I'd wind up sleeping on my mother's floor. We moved to Texas when I was about nine. The hauntings seemed to follow. I could tell that there was something wrong with the house the second I entered the doorway. I guess you could call it a feeling that I had. I always had trouble falling asleep. I would hear the sloshing of boots on the wet carpet, voices that I knew were not my parents. Those things didn't seem to bother me that bad. But what did bother me was when I did fall asleep, I'd wake up and could see an apparition floating above me. It had no recognizable shape to it. I'd stare at it and watch it move for a while. Then I'd run into my mother's room where, for some reason, I felt safe. The scariest thing I've ever encountered in the house was while my room was being renovated. I slept in the living room on the floor, and on this night, there was something that jolted me out of a sound sleep as I lay on the floor, eyes wide open. I looked towards the kitchen. On the wall to the left of the kitchen was something I'd never seen, and I hope I never see again. It stood as tall as the ceilings did. Oh, I'm guessing about eight to nine feet. It was wearing a robe that covered the arms and face. Oh, I never saw any kind of features. I felt threatened by this creature but I had no idea what to do. The creature stood still as I contemplated what actions would be best for me to take. I darted up as fast as I could and ran past the creature. I looked at it as I ran by and all my doubts of me hallucinating were gone. It reached out towards me when I managed to get past it. I took a sharp left turn into my mother's room where I ran to her side of the bed and hit my knees. I buried my head in her stomach and told her what I had seen. No one in my family has ever doubted that I could not only see spirits, but I could hear, smell, and even feel them. I never saw that creature again, just faint whispers, the smell of something burning when nothing was, and footsteps. When I was 17, I decided to go to the Job Corps in San Marcos, Texas. This particular campus is an actual old army base. Our dorm rooms were army barracks where many soldiers at once slept. My first encounter with the apparition was in my dorm room. The lights were always turned out, but the faint glow of the fire escape lights lit up the room. I was sleeping when my eyes bolted open. I could see a man with a rain poncho on and he was covered in water. He appeared to be holding a lantern, and he was about five feet away from me. His mouth was moving, but I never heard a word. I closed my eyes and fell back asleep. A few nights later, I awoke to find the man standing directly above me. I was on the bottom bunk, and I still can't believe no one else saw this man. 
I could see the glow of the lantern clearly, and his poncho was a shade of green. I could see the water dripping onto him, as if he were being rained on. His lips were moving as he looked directly at me, but still I heard nothing. I never felt threatened by him. So then I rolled over and fell back asleep. Many of the girls in my dorm reported seeing two children, a boy and a girl, hang with a bouncing ball. I never saw the children myself, but I never doubted anyone's story either. I came home six months later to the house I never held too dearly. I learned to ignore what I was hearing and feeling. I didn't have any encounters for a while, until I met a guy named Tony. Tony was a strange guy, and he believed in such things as the Necronomicon. Now some people say it's just a book written to make money, but after living with Tony, I believe it's very real. Tony used to walk around the house chanting in Samaritan, and if you've ever read the Necronomicon, it warns you not to chant anything out loud. I swear, even his cat was possessed. It used to sit and stare at me with those big green eyes. It would attack me for no reason. Once I woke up with it sitting on my chest, falling asleep was very difficult for me. Even though Tony and I slept in the same bed, I could hear demonic breathing and it filled the entire room. There were shadows that would move across the walls. I could hear my name being called out. This happened every night that I lived there. I started having nightmares on a nightly basis as well. In my dream, there sat a demon on my chest that was talking to me in Samaritan. I could hear the weight of it as it sneered into my face. It would lower its head until it was touching me. I'd wake up at that moment. Then Tony woke up a few times, and he swears I was talking in Samaria. I moved out after a year, because the intensity of it all was becoming too much for me to handle. Nothing much happened to me until I was about 20. That was when I moved into an apartment in Spring Beach, and again, I could tell you something that was wrong with it. The moment I walked through the threshold, there were three of us living there. Brandon, my boyfriend, and I. Brandon took the bedroom, and Wes and I slept in the living room on a small mattress. The first weird thing happened a few nights after we settled in. That was when all three of us would be in the living room, and Brandon's TV came on. Just a pitch black screen. It happened all the time. One in particular night stands out. This was when I was home alone playing a video game when I heard Brandon's TV come on. And from Brandon's room, I could hear his blinds rustling around. They were closed the last time I went in. I ignored it and then fell asleep. When I woke up in the morning, I decided to go look in his room. The TV was off and the blinds were pulled up and severely tangled. That freaked me out really bad. It only happened once, but still, I'll never forget it. There would be a number of times when I would be in the bathroom and I'd be fixing my hair and I'd see someone walk by the door, even though I was alone. Once I even heard the front door open and I heard a man call out my name, thinking it was one of the boys. No one answered back. I heard the door close and I went to see what was going on. There was no one in my living room, nor was there anyone on my porch. My phone rang, and it was Wes, saying he and Brandon would be home in a few minutes. I moved out shortly after. I am now 22 living in Blainesville, Georgia. I've learned to ignore the spirits that follow me. There are times when I see things, or even smell something funny, and I still hear my name being called out. I've started having extremely weird, but lucid dreams. Nothing really exciting is happening to me in this house. But if it does, you'll be the first to know. After my encounter one late night in August with my sister, I found out that we'd always been around ghosts. My family has moved around five times, and in every place, there have been at least one ghost there with us. When I lived in Texas, I moved from Houston to San Antonio. In that move, a ghost that we'd had for a year followed us to our new apartment. 
After living there for about a year, we discovered a new ghost. This one would hold the bathroom doors closed and knock over our memorabilia items we had on display. The event that completely changed my view of the paranormal happened in August of 2001. It was the early hours in the morning, about 4 a.m., and for some reason I couldn't sleep. My older sister was on her computer, and she found a bunch of old music files she had downloaded for her History of Rock class. Then she came across a Britney Spears parody song, downloaded from a radio station's website. While the song itself was actually only a clip, about 30 to 40 seconds long, we played it, and the file for some reason was corrupt. The words were garbled, playing in a slow, deep, incomprehensible voice. I had chills listening to it play, and when I looked at the corner, it had been playing for over a minute. My sister finally turned it off. She was just as spooked as I was. We moved on, laughing about the look on the other's face. Then about five minutes later, we heard three soft, solid pounds on the back wall, in the far back of the apartment. Neither of us said a word. We just listened, trying to explain away in our minds. We lived on the second floor and shared only one wall, and that was not it. Another couple of minutes passed by, and the banging jumped to one long wall we shared. Still towards the back of the apartment but getting closer, we couldn't help but stare at each other. After that one, we finally decided to ask the other if she'd heard that. Of course we heard the same thing, and not a minute later the banging jumps through the room next to us. On the same wall, three solid bangs escalating in amplitude. My heart was racing waiting for the next set, afraid of where it would jump next. A couple minutes passed, and just as I began to calm down, and blamed the banging on the maintenance worker that we shared the wall with. The banging suddenly jumped forward to the wall behind the computer. I looked above me to see the ceiling light shaking. Moments later, the banging shot across the room to the balcony. It sounded as if the entire wall was pounded on with one giant fist. Three echoing pounds later, everything stopped. I checked the sliding doors, and thankfully they were locked. We both ran into my mother's room, where she was still sleeping. He hadn't heard anything. That is something I will never understand. My baby brother was in the same room with her, door closed, and he heard a soft rumble and my mother heard nothing. After that experience, I've always been a little on edge. I always think about what would have happened if I'd left the sliding doors unlocked that night, and what was the thing trying to get in. One thing I know for sure is that my ghost from Houston left that night, and the one already there seemed to get more active. Everyone started to hear their name being called, even when there was nobody around. No one ever attempted to communicate with whatever it was. As a matter of fact, we rarely began to answer unless we saw the person who was calling us. Two years later, after I finished high school, we moved to Iowa when I was accepted to college, and so far, we have not had any strange occurrences. The same thing followed me around until I finally left your father. My mom told me, after I'd finally told her about the strange experiences I'd been having, since I was 13, something had been terrorizing me. Negative energy had latched onto me and followed me for years whenever I went. It is said that at that age, as a female, your emotions are so unstable. You become very vulnerable to the negative entities that sadly roam the earth in search of company. This entity was particularly depressed and angry. It was smothering and possessive, and sometimes lashed out at me for no apparent reason. It started one night when I awoke to breathing in my ear. It was hard and heavy, like emphysema patients sound when not on a breathing apparatus. Naturally, I was startled and tried to get up to run, but I couldn't move. I was paralyzed. No matter how hard I tried, I could not move a single muscle. The paralysis apparently affected my whole body. I couldn't even open my eyes to scream. By now, the breathing had stopped, but I still couldn't move. Finally, after what seemed like hours of malfunctioning, I jolted upright in bed. Gulping in air, that was when I realized that I hadn't even been breathing during that episode. I was determined to stay up the rest of the night until daylight, but sleep took over and eventually, I was knocked out. 
I awoke again to the same scenario. This time I fought back even harder, and it lasted only less than a second. When I told my dad about this, he had assured me it was a night terror, but suggested I sprinkle holy water in the corners of my room and carry a cross. I later found out that he only said that to avoid scaring me. He actually believed that I was being followed by supernatural force. From then on, although I had not experienced an attack, I continued to see a shadow of a very, very tall with wide man in my closet. I had a rough childhood from 13 until I moved out at 17. I endured a lot of emotional and verbal abuse by my father and hadn't spoken much to my mother in years. I felt very abandoned by both of my parents. I was rebelling to the extreme. I was at an all-time low in my life when I met my boyfriend Maurice. He gave me a reason to be happy again and I fell in love. I moved in with him when I was 17 to get as far away from the abuse as possible. I still saw this shadow figure standing in my closet at night in our new apartment. I refused to sleep alone. Well, I became very dependent on Maurice's company. Maurice, being a skeptic, thought I was just seeing things. One night, as I sleepily crawled out of bed to go to the bathroom, I opened my eyes only to see blackness, pure blackness. I panicked, thinking I had gone blind. When I realized this blackness was swirling, I looked way up and saw that the shadow was standing right in front of me. I screamed and jumped back onto the bed on top of my sleeping boyfriend. I was crying and covering my eyes. He panicked as well and was doing the best to console me without knowing what was wrong. I tried to explain it to him over my sobbing. He became angry and yelled into the thin air for the shadow to leave me alone. Then he turned on the light for me so I could complete my earlier mission. I didn't see the shadow for the rest of the night. On another occasion, I had made the mistake of sleeping alone. My boyfriend was playing video games with a friend. When I awoke, I noticed the room was lighted red. I tried to turn on the light, but it didn't work. I suddenly felt an overwhelming, impending doom that scared me so badly. I perceived the run from the room. That's when I suddenly awoke again. Okay, it was suddenly a dream. I thought, thank God. But again, I noticed the room lighted red as in the dream. This time I ran without attempting to turn a light on. I got to my boyfriend and lay down sleep on the couch. I awoke later back in my room in the same exact scenario. Finally, I started to cry and I ran to my boyfriend asking him to hold me until I fell asleep. I awoke again, this time for real. I was back in my room and noticed that the room was dark now as I remembered it when I fell asleep. I slept on the couch in the living room with my boyfriend until he came to bed with me. We moved into another apartment a few months later in a nicer neighborhood. It was here that the attacks became more frequent and more menacing. I had visions of terrible violence in that apartment that I believe left a lot of negative energy in that place. Then coupled with the worsening violence between me and my boyfriend and the deeper depression I fell into, it made for a very unhappy home. Range things occurred to me almost every night. I still saw the shadow in the closet at night. I would see things move in the corner of my eye. I felt someone watching me all the time. Once the water faucet turned on by itself, I was always losing things. I would hear footsteps coming towards me when I would go to sleep alone, only for them to stop when I turned to see who it was and saw no one there. I became very afraid of looking into mirrors at night. I started sleeping with the lights on and the TV blaring to block out the sound and to avoid seeing things in the dark. Eventually, I stopped sleeping in my bed altogether. When Marie started working the graveyard shift, my boyfriend complained of a corner of our bedroom that creeped him out, and he refused to go near it. One day in the thrills of my depression, following a severe fight with my boyfriend, I decided I couldn't take life anymore. My boyfriend had left for hours, and I had no clue when he was coming back. I felt the presence of the shadow suffocating me. 
I opened a bottle of Lexeter and migraine was sleep aid and downed the entire bottle. Fortunately for me, I had taken in too much of the poison and my body rejected it. I began vomiting profusely until I was dry heaving so badly that I couldn't even breathe. I crawled out of the bathroom in immense pain. I began to feel the effects of what medicine did make into my bloodstream. The entire time I felt the shadow's presence so strongly, it literally suffocated me until I was gasping for air again. I was so high on sleep and I passed out on the floor. I vaguely remember my boyfriend picking me up and placing me in our bed and falling asleep with his arms around me. Not too long after that, my boyfriend and I had planned a movie night together. As I walked into the bathroom to join him, I suddenly noticed a look of terror on his face. I ran to see if he was okay. He just grabbed me and kissed me and said it was nothing. I badgered him to tell me what was wrong. Then finally he says, I saw your shadow. It was hovering behind you while you were coming into the room. Then a chill ran up my spine and I asked him to describe it to me. He then said it was a black cloudy mist that hovered over my head a foot behind me. In the blackness he noticed that there were two holes that looked as though they were its eyes. He was so taken back by what he saw that he blinked hard to make sure it was real, which is when it disappeared. That's when he said, I thought you were just exaggerating about this, that you were just seeing things, but now I know. I'm sorry I didn't take you so seriously. After a year lease was up, I wanted to get as far away as possible from that apartment. The last day in that apartment, we took my son's suggestion and saged the apartment and ourselves. Then we prayed for the shadow to leave and abandoned the apartment. I haven't seen the shadow since, nor have I suffered any more attacks. I have since improved my life drastically with the change in my outlook on life to help guide me. My mom believes that the shadow may have been an extension of my dad, attempting to watch over me. It makes perfect sense. It attacked me the most when my dad and I started drifting further apart from each other. In the midst of my depression, my dad succeeded in taking his life a couple of months after I had gotten rid of the shadow. Although I miss him with all of my heart and soul, I have not felt that negative energy around me since his passing. This to me confirms my mother's belief. Despite this, I sometimes fear the return of the worst thing to haunt me in my life, the shadow. All my life I've been dreaming of becoming an entertainer. It's something that I've always had a passion for, dancing, singing, and the like. And I thought I'd mention that because, well, it may bring more context to the story and possibly explain why I saw and experienced this very unusual paranormal phenomenon. I'm incredibly nervous to share this because people won't believe my story. I know how the internet works. And I don't want to reveal myself because, well, I simply don't want to get bullied and harassed. It sounds ridiculous. It sounds like a cheesy plot to a terrible horror movie. But I don't know what else to say or do to prove that this is a legitimate encounter. Maybe it could have been a demon manifesting as him. You know, truthfully, I don't even think it was MJ himself. But the encounter I had with him looked distinctly like him. He's the most recognizable man on the planet. Also, please note that this in no way is demeaning or disrespecting the man in any way, shape, or form. I'm not going to bash him or talk about his personal life and my personal opinions of the controversies. I've always seen him as an inspiration as an inspiring artist myself, and I have many dance videos of me practicing that I plan on uploading to YouTube over the years, so that hopefully I could be a background dancer for choreography for various pop artists in the industry. That was the purpose of those videos, and when I get the courage to do so, I'll upload them. But right now, I'm going to tell you the ghost stories of what I thought was Michael Jackson appearing to me. So let's backtrack to 2007 for a bit. I had previously moved to Japan in 2004 because it had been a lifelong dream. I'd been working at the record store back in Tallahassee, Florida, and was 25. Oh, you could really see how much I was obsessed with music, dance, singing, and choreography. I had decided I was going to take the plunge, save up as little amount of money as I could, 
and get myself to Japan. So this was the first real experience to get out and get a real feel of foreign culture. Also, let me just say that there is no place in the world quite like Japan. Before I had visited Tokyo and Osaka, and I loved how much karaoke is a part of their culture. Again, any form of entertainment being able to perform in front of people and bringing love and light to this world is what I'm all about. There is really not anything I would want to do more than anything to breathe and love music. And I guess that's why I gravitated towards Michael Jackson. He set the benchmark as an entertainer. Not many people can come close to him. And I just have such reverence for him and his work ethic. I never had any real role models growing up in my own household. My dad left me when I was a child. And my mom was addicted to drugs. Well, oftentimes, I'd be bounced around my grandparents and uncle's home. I remember my uncle first introduced me to Billie Jean. And I'd play down a cassette and watch videos of MJ in action. It was magic. And I was mesmerized. I figured no matter what he went through, if I could push myself and be who I wanted to be, I could make it in life, just like MJ. So back to Japan in 2007, it was announced that Michael Jackson would be making an appearance in Tokyo. I was absolutely gobsmacked to hear that he would be landing in New Tokyo International Airport in Chiba Prefecture. At the time, I had been working at a cafe in Kyoto and I decided to skip work that day so I could head to the airport to get a glimpse of the man in action. Jackson was here to host an exclusive party, where if fans paid a large sum of money, they could potentially meet the King of Pop for a couple minutes. But sadly, since I was nearly broken young, I didn't have the kind of money to meet him, and it was a bit devastating. This was a big deal for Jackson. Because of his acquittal in June of 2005, this was his first public appearance since the trials. There was still hope though, because he was hosting a fan art contest for Japanese who couldn't get tickets for the meet and greet, and three winners of the contest would be chosen to have dinner with him and a picture taken. The problem, I was no artist, just a dancer who loved to entertain and sing, and I wasn't Japanese, but I was living in Japan and I didn't even know if I would qualify. Needless to say, I tried my best to paint a piece a few days before the party. I remember I made a drawing, which sadly I don't have any more of Michael Jackson, in his iconic trademark thriller jacket, moonwalking with the beautiful night sky in the background. It sounded a lot better than it actually looked, but I figured, what do I have to lose? Unfortunately I didn't win the contest, and wasn't chosen, but to tell you the truth, I didn't feel bad at all. I wasn't expecting to win anyway, but at least I got to go to the event he hosted, where he spoke briefly, and I got to meet some Japanese friends who really loved him. So that was that. Michael Jackson had visited. I didn't get to meet the biggest inspiration of my life, the reason why I keep going. Had I met him, I would have told him the impact he had on me, how I kept the faith throughout my life. As one of his songs put it, I just wanted to let him know how he changed my life for the better. I could have went in a different direction. I could have went to jail or worse. But instead, I focused on my life and career. Gip a couple years later, March 2009. At this point, I had made a name for myself locally as a Michael Jackson tribute artist in Japan. I would volunteer to sing at weddings and dance to Michael's iconic songs. I would also street perform in Tokyo. I wouldn't do any makeup to look like him. I'd just try to recreate some of his wardrobe and pay homage to my favorite artist. There were times I even got paid very little to do. And for once, it felt like I was almost making it a career. But I wanted to think bigger. I wanted to do this as a full-blown career. Like I said, the goal was always to be a dancer for artists. Well, that was what I was really working towards. This is where things got really interesting. Word got out in the press that Michael Jackson was set to announce a series of concerts, and there was an announcement coming in London. Fair enough, Michael Jackson held a press conference that month. Not only that, but he was going to do a contest to collect background dancers, and if you were lucky to be chosen, you would be going on tour with him. Hearing this news, I was over the moon. 
I remember thinking to myself, I could be the one selected for the shows. It was almost like God was giving me another chance. Make this all happen. Then it really hit me. Not realizing my hype for the comeback tours clouded my naive judgment. I didn't have any money to fly out to LA where he would be rehearsing. And I wasn't a professional dancer. I was gutted. Because here I was, so desperate to get close to my favorite entertainer. So I could finally work with him and all the others. But I wouldn't have been given the time of day. Well, I rationalized in my mind. Thought how much it sucked that even though I had the money for a plane ticket, there's no way I would have been able to go to rehearsal for an audition. I know this sounds crazy, and I sound like a wild fan, but this plummeted me into a deep depression. I was spiraling, and at a dead end career-wise. Yeah, I was doing the gigs, but I really felt I wasn't getting anywhere to advance myself. I had this huge full body mirror in my apartment, that I used to practice dance with. I mean, I converted my entire room into a dance studio essentially, and months on end, I'd always be in there when I wasn't at my day job, working tirelessly. But after the concert tour's announcement, I sort of stopped practicing and doing so much. I had ended up becoming burnt out from all the MJ stuff because I had lost hope. I needed to wake up to reality and understand that no matter how hard a person worked, Sometimes certain goals don't go the way you planned, and life doesn't work out the way you want it to. Maybe I'd become too obsessed and possibly insane, but that was truly the darkest moment of my life. I had just considered giving up my goals and just focused on my day job. I just lost all the motivation to do much of anything. I couldn't even listen to Michael's music anymore. I was that lost. Then skipped to June 2009. I will never forget this day for the rest of my life. One of my closest friends, Jenna, had traveled all the way from Florida to visit. She was my ex-girlfriend, but we became friends after. This was the week of June 20th. She was talking to me and had asked me if I was still into dancing, and I told her I couldn't do it anymore because of the tour auditions and other life problems. Even worse, I got the worst message from my brother on Facebook. June 23rd, 2009. My uncle passed away. Remember, my uncle was my inspiration and love for MJ. He's what got me into it. That message from my brother wrecked me. I was a mess. And Jenna had to console me the next couple days. It was like time froze for a moment. And the light in the world went out. I was in shock. And there was nothing I could possibly do to make myself feel better about the situation. I practically went numb. Jenna, though, was awesome. She knew how much I loved MJ. And of course, the concerts were coming up in July. She had secretly bought tickets to see MJ live. And that really made me feel good for a moment. I remember it like it was yesterday. Jenna told me she would try to help me pay for the ticket to London. Was really excited because I had never been to England before. But as we all know, this story doesn't end well. June 25th was the ultimate dagger. Not only was I still suffering from the loss of my uncle, but the news to follow sucked the soul out of me. A nail in the coffin. I just remember not being able to go to sleep the night before. Until maybe 4 a.m. And I slept in until about 11 a.m. Japan time. 4 a.m. is about 12 p.m. Los Angeles time. I just looked that up. Oh, that means that when I woke up at 11 a.m. that time, it would have been 7 p.m., but I'm not terribly sure. So all I remember was waking up. Jenna was in the kitchen. She didn't mention anything, but her face looked of concern. I thought she was upset for me. Told her, please, my uncle's death shouldn't destroy your health, too. I don't want you worrying or something. Then I just remember heading on to Facebook to check up with family. Jenna tried to stop me. She said, Craig, please don't go on the internet. And I remember asking her why. She tried to tell me that if I spent too much time on there, it would trigger my feelings for my uncle and make my health worse. Seeing pics of us together, etc. 
although she was trying to protect me from the MJ news, that there it was. Everybody was talking about it. Friends on Facebook. Family all with the news. MJ dead at 50. I just didn't know what to think anymore. I didn't even think really. My mind was blank. I wasn't even mad at Jennifer for not telling me. I just wanted to give up on life. Not so much because it was MJ, but because of my uncle and my connection with MJ. I thought with MJ being alive, it would at least be the last thing I had with my uncle in a weird way. But after he died so soon after my uncle, it was like everything disappeared from me. A couple days later, Jenna had to go back home. She gave me a hug and told me to message her to let her know I was okay. I don't think I'd ever seen someone so scared for my health like Jenna was, but I insisted I'd be okay. Now here comes the part of the story where it gets incredibly creepy. The ghost parts, if you will. Again, I don't know if the reason this happened was because of my uncle, and I began to lose my mind due to all the grief, but I had some really strange dreams after Michael Jackson died. Dreams that I never previously had before even when he was alive. Never once dreamt of him before. Then skip to January 2010. I found myself standing alone on a desolate stage. The harsh glare of a single spotlight bearing down on me. The air was thick with the eerie silence. Broken only by the faint echo of my own heartbeat. It was pretty foggy. And then, from the darkness behind the reach of the light, he emerged. It was MJ. Dressed in normal clothes. As he came out of the fog, he just stared at me for a couple minutes, not saying a single word. No blinking, nothing. I looked away for a second and looked back. Then he was gone. I awoke drenched in a cold sweat, my heart pounding in my chest. The dream had felt so real and so vivid that it took me a moment to gather my bearings reassure myself that it was just a figment of my overwrought imagination. But as I lay there in the darkness, the memory of that dream lingered like a shadow, casting a pall over my restless mind. What's weird is, I was thinking more about my uncle than I was MJ, and I had another dream where he was there. This time I was at a family reunion inside this huge mansion. We were talking about my uncle, but I just seen Michael Jackson sitting in this chair almost like he was just watching and observing me. It was getting really creepy. I thought about seeing a therapist, but I don't know if I was comfortable telling her about my dreams. Even though they're used to hearing the craziest things, my story would have sent me to the mental asylum. I also didn't know how mental health programs worked in Japan. Oh, I just sort of put it off for a while, but things took a weird turn in the coming months. I remember one night, after a long day's work, I decided to clear my mind as best I could and go walking in the park. I know this sounds crazy, but what I'm about to tell you is 100% real and gives me the shivers to this day. The park was eerily quiet, the only sound being the rustling of the leaves and the gentle breeze from me walking over them. At this point, it was autumn 2010. The dim streetlights cast long wavering shadows creating an atmosphere that felt both tranquil and unsettling. I was lost in thought, barely aware of my surroundings, when I noticed a figure standing by the swings, barely illuminated by the distant light. At first I thought it was just another late night wanderer, but as I drew closer, there was something about the figure that seemed off. He was dressed in a familiar outfit, a black hat and leather jacket but I wasn't entirely sure because it was so vague. When my heart skipped a beat, then I realized it couldn't be. I stopped dead in my tracks, my breath catching in my throat. The figure slowly turned to face me, and I was met with a slight that chilled me to my core. I swear to Jesus it was the face of Michael Jackson, or at least, it looked exactly like him. I sound so crazy saying this, but... I don't know how else to put it. His face was pale, almost luminescent in the faint light, and his eyes, 
pour into mine with an intensity that made my blood run cold. I tried my best to rationalize what I was seeing. It had to be a trick of the light, a figment of my imagination born from my obsession and grief. But the more I stared, the more real he became. He stood there motionless, watching me with an expression that was unreadable, yet deeply unsettling. I wanted to speak and call out to him, but my voice was trapped in my throat and I was trembling against every instinct. Screaming at me to run, I literally just froze there in silence. Then suddenly, the figure began to fade, dissolving into the darkness like smoke. I blinked and he was gone, leaving me alone in the silent, empty park. The cold chill remained, lingering in the air. I stood there for what felt like an eternity, trying to make sense of it all. Was it a hallucination? manifestation of my grief-stricken mind? Or was it something more? Had my deep connection to his music and my personal losses somehow conjured his spirit? Or was I simply losing my grip on reality? The encounter left me shaken, questioning everything I thought I knew about the world and the boundaries between life and death. Whether it was truly Michael's ghost or some figment of my imagination, it was as if, in that fleeting moment, I'd been given a glimpse into the realm beyond our understanding. I don't know if I'll ever fully understand what I saw that night in the park, but one thing is for certain. This event changed me. The fear. The awe. The inexplicable connection. The things I felt in those moments lingered with me, urging me to keep going, to push through the darkness, and find its meaning. It had been months since the unsettling encounter in the park. The weight of my grief had lessened, but I carried a lingering sadness. I had avoided dancing, feeling disconnected from the passions that once drove me. My dance studio with its full-size mirror had become a place I rarely visited. One night, after a particularly restless evening, I decided to return to the studio. It was late. I turned on a single lamp, casting a soft dim light across the room. I stood before the mirror, feeling a mix of nostalgia and sorrow. The reflection staring back at me looked tired and defeated. I began to stretch, trying to reconnect with the rhythm and movements that had once brought me so much joy. The mirror reflected my every emotion, and for a moment, I almost felt like my old self. I then closed my eyes, lost in the music playing softly from my phone trying to lose myself in the familiar routines. When I opened my eyes, I froze. There he was again, the unmistakable face of Michael Jackson. His expression was somber. Michael's face was subtle, almost like a shadow, but undeniably there. My heart pounded in my chest as I stood rooted to the spot, unable to tear my gaze away from the mirror. Michael didn't move didn't speak, just watched me with an intensity that made my skin crawl. I don't even remember how long it was that I saw him for, but he was there. I stood there for a long time, just staring at my reflection, trying to make sense of what just happened. The encounter was brief but deeply disturbing. It was as if he had returned one last time to remind me of something important, that there was something that I yet had to fully understand. My honest feelings about this whole situation is that it was a demon taking the form of Michael Jackson. That's my gut instinct. I heard that negative spirits tend to attach themselves to you during your weakest moments. So for me, I think that the demon took the things that I looked up to the most and tried to scare me with it. One last encounter that I will share. There was one night when I drifted off to sleep. I found myself in a dream that felt so different, more vivid and unsettling. I was back in my childhood home, the one where I had spent countless hours with my uncle. The home seemed like everything was normal. In the living room, there was a soft glow of the TV illuminated in the darkness. A Michael Jackson concert was playing, one of those classic performances my uncle and I used to watch together. I could hear the muffled sound of the music and it drew me closer. As I approached the TV, the image flickered and sounded distorted. 
creating an eerie, otherworldly atmosphere. Then suddenly, I felt a presence behind me. I turned slowly, and that's when I saw my uncle standing in the doorway. He looked just as he did before he passed, but there was something off. There was something unsettling in his gaze. His eyes were hollow, and his expression was a mix of sadness and something I couldn't quite place. Uncle, I whispered, my voice trembling, but there was no response from him. He just stared at me with those empty eyes. The silence stretched on, just heavy and oppressive. Then, without warning, he moved towards me. His steps were slow and deliberate. I really wanted to speak. I said, uncle, what's going on? I miss you, uncle. But there was no response from my uncle. Just a deep hollow glow and the stare right back at me. Oh, that's where my stories have come to an end. Please don't judge me about any of the events that happened. For the last time, these were my real experiences. I'm not the type of person to exaggerate. My friends and family can back that up. But again, this is only my word. Thank you, Phantom, for letting me share this experience with you. I really can't wait to hear what you have for me. I'm 37 years old and was born on October 4th, 1968. On October 1st of the same year, my first cousin was born. Our parents were so excited because we were born so close together. It was my aunt and uncle's second child and I am an only child. Our very first Christmas, the family gathered at my grandma's house. You see, my aunt and uncle were from out of town, so we were all to be at grandma's house on Christmas Eve. When we arrived, my mother realized that my cousin and I even had on the same outfits. My mother said it made sort of special after what happened. About four months later, my aunt had went into the hospital. My uncle, being at home with a small child and a baby, put the baby in bed with him. In the night, he rolled over on her and smothered her to death. When he awoke, it was too late. He called my grandmother, and all he could do was scream into the phone. She's gone. Having children myself, I can only imagine the heartache. The story has haunted me for years, but in a way I cannot explain. At about the age of 17, I started to realize that when I went on vacation or visited somewhere special, I had a feeling inside of me that I couldn't explain. All I knew was for some reason I would stand and stare and start to cry. Being young, I tried to hide it at first. Then I began to wonder what was wrong with me. As I got older, I would try to really ask myself why I was feeling this way. And one day I got an answer from the inside of me. That's the only way I know how to explain it where it came from. I don't even remember where I was or what I was experiencing at the time. But I was getting emotional again, and I heard a voice in my head say, Go, see for me, because I can't. Take me with you. I honestly believe that she was with me. In all the things I've experienced in my life, she had been here with me. I would like to tell my mother, but I'm not sure she would understand. I always feel her, and I feel connected to her, even though I never really knew her. This paranormal event happened at the Royd in Arizona House State Park. This is my testimony of the haunting. When the Roydens lived in that mansion, they had a rather large garden not far from the house. Where that garden used to be now stands a large entertainment superstore, Hastings Entertainment. Not too long ago, I was the assistant manager of the store. One night, another associate and I braved the attic to retrieve some DVD lock boxes. I was standing on the ladder with half of my body inside of the attic, while my associate held the ladder for me. I started to throw down some locked boxes, when I suddenly heard a little girl's voice. I stopped, as I just thought I was hearing things. My associate informed me at this moment that I looked like I was about to vomit. I took a deep breath, and continued my duty. Then I heard it again, but this time it was unmistakable. The little girl's voice said, get out. I was down that ladder faster than you could say white as a ghost. Because we had a duty to complete, 
I had my associate climb the ladder to retrieve the rest of the locked boxes. He positions herself just as I had when suddenly both of us heard it again. Get out. It was so loud I heard it from where I was standing below the attic. She instantly said I'm out and shot down the ladder just as fast as I had. We exited the stockroom and decided to make do with what lock boxes were retrieved. Being paranormal enthusiasts, we discussed what happened at great length. Of course, when we told other employees, most of them stated, I'm not going to encourage your quest for adventure, whatever that means. This incident sparked my curiosity about the house. I had heard Hastings used to be the location of the Rundin's garden. But rumors tend to fly around Flagstaff like undergarments at a Rolling Stones concert. I decided to look into it by taking the Royden Mansion tour, and the tour guide confirmed the rumor. He stated that the garden is where the daughters used to spend a lot of time. He also confirmed rumors of hauntings in the mansion. Shortly after I took the tour, I heard from a book department associate at Hastings that she heard the pitter-patter of feet in that area at night, when no one was around her but her. The books department is just below the attic where the lockboxes are held. Months later, a stocking associate went all the way up to the attic and stood as he sorted through the lockboxes. He fell through the sheetrock and barely missed injury. Perhaps the little girl was right for trying to warn us. When I was about four or five years old, my sister and I were spending the night with my grandmother who had just lost her husband three days earlier. My sister and I slept in the same room with our grandmother. In the middle of the night, a sound woke me up. It sounded like coffee percolating, so I got up to see what it was. I walked down the hall from the bedroom to the kitchen and there he was sitting at the table, her husband. It must have not bothered me because I sat down at the table and carried on the conversation with him. Though to be honest, there wasn't any mouth movements from his end. He was just silent and staring at me. That's when I thought things were getting a little creepy. And then the conversation I had kind of trailed off. Now mind you, this wasn't an elaborate conversation. This was just me saying a couple words or something. My grandmother said she woke up and heard me talking to someone but didn't know who it could have been. Oh, I got up from the table and walked down the hallway to the bedroom door and told her that he wanted to talk to her. She said with confusion that he was dead, and I replied, no, he's not. He's in the kitchen, and I turned to walk down the hall, and he was standing at the end of it. A couple of minutes later, time went by, and he was gone just like that. I swear to this day, I can still hear that coffee pot gurgling in the middle of the night sometimes. And whenever I do, I get this weird feeling, like he's just around the corner waiting. I could hear him telepathically speak to me and say see you later somehow. Not sure how or why, but it creeps me out. I went back to my sister, burying myself under the covers. The warmth of flimsy shield against the sudden cold that seeped into the room. But sleep couldn't come. Every creak of the floorboards, every sigh of the wind outside, it all sent fresh jolts of fear through me. The gurgling sound thankfully never returned that night. But the memory of it, and the phantom scent of coffee that lingered in the air, kept me wide awake until the first sliver of dawn peeked through the curtains. My grandma, pale and drawn, had at the kitchen table a cup of untouched coffee growing cold beside her. She didn't mention grandpa that morning, and neither did I, but a heavy silence hung in the air, a silent acknowledgement of what had transpired the night before. Years passed, the memory of that night faded, becoming a hazy antidote I'd occasionally share with friends always met with a mix of skepticism and amusement. But then a few months ago, something happened that sent shivers down my spine and unearthed the long dormant terror. I was visiting my grandma again, this time alone. She'd aged considerably. 
her once vibrant eyes now clouded in distance. One evening as we sat sipping tea, a sudden gust of wind rattled the windows. A flicker of movement caught my eye in the hallway leading to the kitchen. My breath hitched. There for a fleeting moment, I saw a figure standing in the doorway. An old man hunched slightly, his features obscured by the dim light. My heart pounded a frantic rhythm against my ribs. Would it be? Grandma, I croaked. My voice barely a whisper. Did you see that? She turned to me slowly, a flicker of recognition crossing her face. See what, dear? She asked, her voice raspy with age. In the hallway, I stammered, my gaze fixed on the empty doorway. Oh man, did you see him? A long, heavy silence followed. Then tears started to roll down her cheek. Sometimes, she whispered, her voice barely audible. He comes back, just to say goodbye again. I wanted to share a story with you regarding ghost contact through dreams. On June 1st, 2006, one of my best friends and fraternity brothers passed away due to sudden burst of capillaries in his brain. My best friend and I, a great friend to him, found him in his room without response after he had been complaining that evening of a horrible headache. After calling 911, he went through two brain surgeries to save his life, but sadly the efforts failed. His death has been extremely hard on me. I've been thinking about how good of a friend he was to me, and whether or not he knew it. It has really bothered me. This afternoon after class I took a nap, because I was exhausted from staying up late the night before. In my dream I was in a hallway. Now I cannot decide whether it was a school or a hospital, but in my dream I was aware that Richie was dead. He appeared in the hallway to me, and I remember being dumbstruck and unable to speak. He appeared anxious at my difficulty. And I finally blurted out to him, I loved you, and you were my second best friend. He looked perplexed and said no. We were brothers. In his life, being fraternity brothers meant more to him than anything, and he hated how many of us had best friends. That is all I remember from the dream. I really feel that Richie visited me in my dream to soothe my mind about our friendship. We were brothers and he was confirming that he knew what that meant to both of us. I woke up in chills and all that would happen during my dream. I love your sight and I'm happy to share my story with you. I'm 15 years old and when I was about 8, I saw something I will never forget. I was watching TV with my younger sister when my mom called me from the kitchen to go and get my dinner. As I turned to go through the doorway to the kitchen, I saw a boy roughly my age standing in the hall. The thing is I could see straight through him. I was a bit freaked out and turned to look at my sister to see if she had seen anything. But she just went straight through to the kitchen. So I turned around and the boy was gone. I thought nothing of it and just figured I was seeing things. Later that day my mom asked me to go and fetch something from the upstairs bathroom. The bathroom was right next to the door to my bedroom. And as I walked by for some reason, I looked into my bedroom and I saw the same transparent boy standing in front of my dresser. I was really scared and refused to go upstairs for the rest of the day. I haven't seen the boy since, but sometimes I feel him about. This is not the only weird experience I've had. A few years ago, I had a friend over on Halloween and we were talking with only a candle on well, we could see each other. In the middle of our conversation, the candle went out. Well, I got up to turn the light on, but when I did, the candle came back on again. Later that same night, a glass jar full of glass stones threw itself at my friend's head. We were really badly shaken up and didn't sleep well that night. I really believe in ghosts. I know that they are real and walk this earth. I admit, 
I've never seen one face to face or anything, but I have a feeling that they are always around me. Well, my first encounter was when I went to sleep over my cousin's house. I was sleeping in the middle of both my cousins, hence I was the smallest in all. That night I woke up wanting to go to the bathroom. I was about to wake up my oldest cousin to tell her to go with me, because it was dark and didn't want to go by myself. I stopped and decided not to, thinking she was going to think I was some kind of a high cat, or would get mad at me for waking her up in the middle of the night. Well, then I get out of bed and went into the hall. My heart was pounding because I was really afraid of the dark, and I couldn't turn on the hall light because my aunt would get mad, hence they had trouble with the electricity bill. Well, anyway, the bathroom was all the way down the hall. Well, then I walked as fast as my little chubby legs would walk. When I got into the bathroom and turned on the light, I was so happy. I did my business. The worst part was opening the bathroom door and turning off the light because then everything will turn pitch black all over again. Oh, I took a deep breath, turned it off, and started walking. That's when I heard the little rustling and the little footsteps. I was about to call out who is there. When I saw a little person peeking around a corner of the hall, I stopped dead in my tracks. I swear I saw the little person give me an evil grin in my way. I couldn't tell because I was already running to my cousin's room. I got into the middle and felt safe. Well, that's my story. Other than that, in my house, I always hear noises. I'm a night person. I am always in the last in my family to go to sleep. I stay up every night reading a book. Home nights while I am reading, I can assure you I'm wide awake and alert. I hear someone in the kitchen getting water from the sink or someone shuffling my parents' papers in the dining room. I'm the only one with a view of the living room, in the kitchen and the dining room. It's really weird hearing those sounds, since I didn't really see anyone come down the hall of my past my room. Other times I hear footsteps in the hall going back and forth, but I don't see anyone. I don't think it's anything evil. I just think they are ghosts who are wandering around my house. Or the ghost of the old lady who lived here before us. The lady was found in the living room on the floor because her granddaughter treated her really badly. He didn't feed her. My husband and I have lived in the same condo for nearly eight years now. It's become our home, and we're so happy with staying here until we're more financially stable to buy a house. I've never had any bad feelings here. But I've always felt like there was something around us. Our daughter used to talk about a lady in a blue shirt that kept trying to take her water. She kept by the bed. She would also have guests for tea besides her stuffed animals and dolls. When she pointed out a picture of my Aunt Katie, we knew it was her immediately. Our daughter was only a little over two when Katie passed away from diabetes complications. But in that time they had together, she brought so much happiness. Well, now I feel something in her room. I know it's Katie there watching over her. All their family members have had visits too. The radio will come on when a Smokey Robinson song is playing. Or it will turn to our favorite station. We have other visitors too. Mostly family, I believe. My husband was laying in bed the other day. After kicking the cats out of bed. And reading a bit. He works nights. Just as he was about to close his eyes, someone rattled the hangers in the closet. He looked up and saw them moving. There were no windows open. The cats were out. And nothing had fallen. He believes it was his mother sending him a message to chill out, as he had been stressing all week about a job interview. To the point it was affecting our daily lives. He was the first person to pop into his head when it happened. We also have someone being mischievous here. I cleaned out my purse the other night, trying to find my wallet. I completely emptied the purse and it wasn't there. This morning, it was right in the top. My sewing things got moved. He's that were hung up the night before across the room in the morning. Little things like that. I've also heard them too. A couple of times I'll be reading or something, and I'll hear a faint voice. Once it simply said hi, 
Another time it sounded like a couple was whispering. None of it has been frightening. Most of it has been comforting, in fact. I'm not sure who else is here, besides our family, or who likes to play jokes, but they are welcome. They've never scared us, and when my daughter was little, and was becoming frightened, I asked them to stop and they did. I guess we're pretty lucky to have respectful ghosts. They feel like part of the family after all this time. I'd better mention Otis or I'll pay for it later. Otis was our cat we had when we moved in here. She had an attitude to say the least, and her favorite game was terrifying anyone that came to visit by trapping them in the kitchen and growling at them. But she was always loving to us, and very protective. Sadly, she became ill, and we had to put her to sleep about three years ago. But she still comes around, even more now than another cat we rescued who is the smitting image of her, but a lot more friendly. I've seen both our cats jump on the bed, only to get scared and jump off again like she was there to let them know it was still her spot. I felt her climb up on the bed when I'm reading, and when I look to see which cat it is, there's nothing there but an impression. I've even heard her purr when no other cats are around. Oh, so she's still there, and still taking her claim on her favorite spots, and letting the other cats know who's boss from the other side. I grew up in a duplex home on Bolster Avenue in Lemoyne, Pennsylvania. We lived there from the time I was five years old until I was 15 years old. There was a steep, narrow staircase in the home. Every time you would walk down the stairs, it felt like someone was right behind you. I never turned around because I was too scared. As a child, I would always run down the stairs because the feeling was so intense. My brother did the same thing. My parents would always scold us for running down the stairs. Because they were so steep, they were afraid we would fall. There were times that night that we would hear sounds in the attic. It sounded like crumbling paper. There was also one bedroom that was extremely cold. It was my room first. I hated sleeping there. It always felt cold, and on many occasions the door would slam shut, or items would fall or appear in different places. The door was cracked, so it was so difficult to close by hand. It needed to be forcefully pushed shut in order to close completely. When it slammed shut on its own, it always closed completely. I disliked the room so much I traded rooms with my younger brother. He felt uncomfortable in the room too. So much so, that my parents ended up using that room. They didn't have any problem with the room other than the feeling of coldness. On one occasion, my father came upstairs and saw someone standing in the bathroom out of the corner of his eye. He proceeded to the bathroom and called out, let me know when the bathroom is available. He didn't hear anything, and after a few minutes he looked in the bathroom again, and there was no one there. No one else had been upstairs. We never really discussed the feeling in the stairway until we moved from the home. I remember saying to my family that it always felt like there was someone breathing down my neck when I came down the stairs. After we started discussing it, we found that we had that feeling, but never talked about it. We asked some of our family and friends if they ever felt uncomfortable in the home. Everyone we spoke to with mentioned the same feeling of a presence behind them while walking down the stairs. Since I was little, I've been sensitive to ghosts. The same time I had dreams that would later turn out to be true. Could tell which song was on next on the radio. Knew who the phone call was too, etc. My experiences tend to happen at times when I'm either feeling low or just open towards the other side. My stories. As a little girl, I didn't like being on my room after it got darker darker when it was summertime. I remember feeling being watched and something wasn't right. At the same time, I was very afraid for the door leading back to our house in the stables. I felt something was looking at me and wanting to hurt me. This was from when I was around 6 and stopped when I was 12. Sometimes they would only show up once. Once I was in bed and was close to falling asleep, I suddenly heard a voice calling my name. I woke up completely and looked into the corner of my room, and there was an old woman there. 
I couldn't see her clearly because she was kind of blurry, but she had a friendly feeling about her. She then disappeared, and I never saw her again. When I was 17, my dog died, and I was absolutely devastated. A few weeks later, I heard him coming up to my room from the kitchen and saw him enter my room. He then jumped up on my bed, walked around three times before sighing, and got down. I could feel him on my bed and against my leg. When I tried to touch him, that's when he disappeared. It did, however, make me feel a lot better after he came and visited me. My parents' farm where most of the events happen is old. It burned down once there, and there seems to be quite a lot of ghostly activity involved. In the barn, my parents got their car, and since I was little, I was afraid of being there alone. I felt something was wrong, and that something was hanging in the dark. I always felt uneasy there, until a few years ago that my mom told me that someone had hanged himself there. My worst experience I've ever had was when I was 15 to 17 years old. My room was connected to the kitchen by a little hallway. From the kitchen, you can go directly to the living rooms. The last one I've never felt easy in. There was always something feeling unnaturally cold and just weird. One night I woke up, and my room was ice cold. I heard someone open the door from the hall to the kitchen. It was a man I somehow knew and he was going directly to the last of the living rooms. Somehow I was there when he went there. I saw him take his rifle and mess with himself. It was feelings more than actually seeing him do it. I then was back in my body, but heard him fall down on the floor, moved a bit, and moaned before he died. The second that happened, the coldness disappeared, and I could breathe again. I told my friend at the time about it, but I was too afraid to ask my parents. One day, sort of jokingly asked if anyone had hurt themselves in that room. My dad turned around and looked at me with a strange look. Mm, yes, your godmother's father hurt himself there. They hadn't told me because my godmother didn't like me to know. I found his grave, and it happened the exact day he hurt himself. I've had nice experiences, though. A friend of my parents and their friends hurt herself. My friend was really devastated about it and couldn't get over it. One day we were in the kitchen. I saw a sort of fog that turned into a ghostly hand. It stroked her head as it soothed her. After it disappeared, my friend looked at me and said she was here. My friend then told me that she felt peace and that the friend had told her that she was happy now. To both of us that meant a lot. The latest year the happenings happens without any real pattern. Last year when I was at my parents and sleeping in my old rooms, I didn't get any sleep for at least four days I was there. There was a presence in the room, and it was not a pleasant one. It just radiated hatred, and it was pointed at me for some reason. And the next time I got home, it wasn't in there, but then I had to sleep in my mom's bedroom. I was woken up by someone slamming their hands into the bed very hard. I looked at the end of the bed, and I saw shadow standing there, but then disappeared. Since then, I haven't felt it. For some reason, I knew it was male, but I don't know why it felt so badly about me. When I'm home at my parents' now, there's a young girl there. Something I can't feel what is in a man. None of these are evil, but just looking out for me. I've seen the girl from the corner of my eyes and seen her reflected in the mirror. I think they are protecting me, and just looking out for me. Sometimes I can enter a house and know that there's more than just what the eyes can see. I felt the presence of family are just passerbyers. I think that my parents' house and me makes an energy field where they can enter, and some stay, and some do not. I got one in my room where I live now, just a little prankster really, turns on my computer, opens all the cupboards. I did have an old man who loved to watch me shower. I told him that it was rude and that I didn't like it. But since then, he hadn't been there. At the same time, there's a girl running every night on the upper floor. My brother is sensitive too, but apparently never experienced the same as I have at my parents' house. Seems I'm the only one that they get attracted to. Also felt being pushed, but that happened in my parents' house too. 
I don't mind having this ability, but I have to learn to control it, because sometimes it can get too much. My building was built in the early 1800s. We have had experiences within this build that are questionable. We call our presence Felix. When I first purchased the building in 1985, we used to hear a rocking chair located on the second and the top floor of the building. When I asked the previous owner and showed her the location of where we were hearing this chair rock, she stated that this was her father and he had his rocking chair. The upstairs was completely emptied at the time. The upstairs had the latch doors, yet I would find doors open even after I knew I had shut them. Lights go on for no apparent reason. The same with blow dryers. The lower or first door is a barber shop. Runs out, so was Felix. We have found things moved. There are so many different things I thought I'd bring it to your attention. My building is in West Warwick. Others would swear to the things I would tell you. It's okay. Felix has been here far longer than we have, and we have no problem with having Felix around. Well, my first experience of ghosts was when I was about 12 years old, and I had gone on school to Swanage in Dorset. I'm from England. The bed and breakfast we stayed in was beautiful. It was an old house with a giant sweeping staircase, high ceilings, and so on. After we had stayed there a few days, the whole class complained of someone knocking on their doors. It was a really quick knock-knock. It happened to our room a few times. And once we actually waited behind the door for the knock-knock to occur, when it happened, we instantly opened the door, and to our surprise, there was no one there. There was no way you could hide anywhere either. Our room was the first room as you stepped in from the front porch, of which the doors were transparent. Oh, there was no way anyone could get outside and hide quick enough. Our bedroom door opened out into a huge empty reception area. There were doors all around the edges with nothing in the middle of the room. There was literally nowhere for anyone to hide that quickly, thinking nothing of it. The teachers took us out one evening to the beach to wear us out. When we got back to the bread and breakfast, however, there were some of the girls returned to their rooms to find that all their lights were on, with the covers thrown back from their beds and their door wide open. Nothing wrong there, you think, but... Every time we went out, our teachers made sure that all of our rooms were spotless, beds made, clothes away, all lights were turned off, and so on. All the doors were also on their spring hinges, so that every time you opened them and let go, they would automatically spring shut. The door had been found wide open, and the owners insisted that no one had been around either. This is about the poltergeist ghost. My second experience of ghostly going ons happened to me a few years later, when I was about 15 whilst on holiday in the Aveline in Portugal, in the villa in which we were staying. The villa was huge, as there were about 10 of family and friends. It had three floors. The bottom floor was bedrooms. The middle floor was the kitchen, living room, dining room, and so on. And the top floor was again bedrooms. Me and my friend at the time had a room on the bottom of the house, which had patio doors that opened out into the swimming pool. Lying in bed at night and on more than one occasion, we could hear the water breaking as though someone was swimming in the pool. Rushing to the window, we would always discover nobody there. We would also hear the back gate squeak open and shut at night and again. Nobody was there. The bedside lamp would also spontaneously switch itself on, but being young and naive, we would obediently turn it off and think nothing of it. On our final night in the house, my mom claimed that she woke up during the night to hear someone wandering around upstairs. It was on the bottom floor also, opening and closing cupboards, thinking that it was one of the ten people in the house she dozed off back to sleep. In the morning, when my mom spoke to friends on the top floor, they claimed that they also heard cupboards opening and shutting, and also assumed it was one of us. Only then did they realize that it wasn't actually any of us at all. And now, it was about two years ago in this other story. I was 19 then, that me and my mom went to see a medium. 
Derek Okura for those of you in the UK. Not sure if he's known in the US. Think of him as a UK equivalent to Jonathan Edwards, who was performing on stage in Swindon. Wiltshire, southwest of England by the way. I had insisted to my mom that we go to see him, as we had avidly watched him on Living TV's Most Haunted. So my mom came not expecting much, whereas I secretly hoped that something would happen, as I think everyone does who attends those kind of things, and I was not to be disappointed. Derek came on stage and introduced himself. And they started to contact spirits on the other side. And lo and behold, it was my mom's great grandmother, Nanny Wu Wu, who was the first in the queue to talk. I won't bore you and go into great detail with what Derek told us, but everything he mentioned was so accurate, and it was just amazing. This man who I'd only watched on TV was now standing a few feet away from me, and my mom in person, telling us personal things that had gone on within the four walls of our home. That only we knew. He knew that my granddad, Nanny Wu Wu's son, was a bit down at that time, that he was on medication. He knew that my dad had injured his knee and so many other things. He also predicted that my mom would get a promotion by Friday. We went to see him on a Wednesday, and she did. Derek also made a reference to a conversation that my mom had with my dad on the way to see him just a mere hour before. How weird is that? Just knowing that my mom's great-grandmother, although I never knew her, is around and watching over our lives is a comforting thought. Anyway, I think I've rambled for long enough. I have a comment about the Gertrude Center in Iowa's Devil's Chair. After one of my friends read your site, I was talking on the phone with him, and he told me about the chair and what happened to that one man. I'm not a big believer in ghosts, per se, but I do believe in supernatural and spirits. When I first heard it, I laughed and told him that we were going there the next night. We ended up heading on over there. Him, my friend, and I at about 8.45 p.m. in the winter. It was pitch dark already. He was told where it was. You have to turn left on the second dirt road, and it's on the right towards the top of the hill. So then we went over there and I saw it. Momentarily I started getting chills. Not just because of the story, but because of what it looked like. All in the cemetery. It's in the shape of logs with a drape or something over the top of it. Looked like Jesus' robe draped over the broken down cross. Along the bottom it appears to be the shape of ferns. Although at first it looked like alligator tails in an old fashioned cushing looking seat. The second we got out of the car. The wind seemed to have picked up, because my hair was whipping around. Just being around it was creepy, but soon enough, none of us would sit in it. So we got back in my car, and drove around to the front to study it. After we sat there for a while, we soon found out we were all too scared to go sit in it. So we headed back to Panorama, seven miles east of Guthrie. This is the scary part. That night my friend stayed at my house. Above my bed is a window, and on either side are two one foot one mirrors, and many sharp pieces of broken mirror and in between art, stuck on by mirror stickers. Very strong ones. I tried to pull them off, and they just ripped through the middle, if they even come off at all. Anyways, they've been on there for a few weeks. We finally went to bed around 12 a.m., and she fought and won the inside of the bed, near the windows and mirrors. We finally fell asleep about 2.30 a.m., and at some time in the night, the top mirror, approximately five to six feet from my bed, fell down, hit the inside corner of the bottom mirror, right above my friend's head, but ended up to the right of the bed. Weird, huh? Anyways... The alarm went off at about 6.45 a.m. She woke up and started getting ready. I fell back asleep and then woke up at 7.30 a.m. As I was lying there, I heard a weird sound and looked up at my wall to find the top mirror off the wall. The stickers unlatched themselves. They didn't even rip, and all of these pieces of broken mirror were laying on my friend's pillow. Ironic, I think not. 
Those stickers were like they were promised. To stay on the wall. Luckily, we didn't sit in the chair. When we first saw the house, I loved it. But I was pregnant with our third child. And there was only two large bedrooms and one small bedroom. It was an old farmhouse. And it was built in a T-shape. Much like most of the houses built in the 1800s because of the central fireplaces. When we told the owner we needed something with more rooms, she said we probably wouldn't want it anyway, because it was haunted. She then went on to tell us that her husband was away on a business trip, and she was alone in the house except for her little dog. They were asleep one night. When the dog started to bark, she then opened her eyes and at the foot of her bed was a woman standing looking at her. When she rised up, the woman turned and went out the door. That incident frightened her so badly that she swore she would not stay in the house alone again. She eventually sold the house, and the new owners built a large addition onto the back of the home, and did so many so-called improvements on it. After living there for several years, they went bankrupt. The house sat empty for many years. I happened to drive by it one day and saw the for sale in the yard. We went to the bank and bought it. The neighbors told us it was haunted, that they saw people in the windows, and heard things coming from the home. I had a little lady that babysat for me full time. She would not go upstairs alone, and she said she felt like someone was watching her. He never went into the basement even as someone else was going. Heard people talking, and saw two men in the parlor. My daughter had a rocking chair in her room. One day she went into her room and it was rocking all by itself. I found out later that a young woman had died during childbirth in that same room. We guessed she was rocking her baby, my grandson. At age four was sleeping in the small bedroom and told us that there was a lady in a long dress in the room during the night. No one gets too upset from these sightings. We figure that they were here before we were and they feel comfortable with us too. They have apparently accepted us as well. I've been reading all the stories trying to find something similar to what happened when I was about 9 to 10 years old. I'm not sure what it was that I saw, but I haven't been able to explain it. Let me start by saying that when I was a kid, I slept with an old baby blanket that I had forever. One night I went to sleep with a small blanket spread out over the comforter as well. I remember waking up in the middle of the night when everyone else was asleep. My bedroom door was closed and the foot of my bed was about three or four feet away from the door. I laid awake, then staring at the door, when two flat spots of light started swirling on the door. It sort of looked like when the cable goes out on the TV. That snowy effect. Anyway, it sort of looked like that, but not as bright as an actual TV, and the light was just spinning. Then it was swirling around in a circle. I thought at first I was seeing things, and tried to tell myself that it was car lights or something, but it didn't look like that, and there was no sound of passing cars outside. Everything was quiet outside. Then suddenly, the two flat swirling circles seemed to pop off the door and become like little men and creatures standing near the end of the bed. I don't remember too well what they looked like anymore, but I remember them being about two feet tall, no necks, fat little bodies. They seemed to have faces, but I couldn't tell you what they looked like, just sort of a suggestion of facial features, and they were made out of this weird light. I sat up in bed frightened out of my mind and clutched the blankets up to my chin. They walked towards the bed and started climbing up the bed by holding onto the blankets. I could feel them tucking the blankets. When they got to the top, they began pulling on my favorite blanket. At first, I tried to pull it back away from them, but they kept pulling, and I seemed to go weak and just let it go. They climbed down the end of the bed and back up onto the floor, this time with my blanket that they spread out behind them flat on the door. It made me think of them having a picnic on it. All the while I remember they made small sounds like they were talking to each other, but very faintly. I couldn't make out any words. They became flat swirling circles of light again and then seemed to vanish through the door. I pulled out the comforter over my head and just cowered there. 
then shaking until I guess I just eventually went back to sleep. The next morning I had breakfast and was going to head out the door when I suddenly remembered what happened and thought, wow, what a weird dream. I went upstairs to look for my blankets. I looked everywhere in my room but couldn't find it. I even checked between the sheets and under the mattress, but it wasn't there. I asked my brothers if they'd taken it as a joke, and they looked at me like I was crazy, and said why the heck would we take your stupid blankets? I asked my mom if she took it to the wash or something, then she said no. I checked all over the house and couldn't find it anywhere. The last place I looked was the basement, which I'd always found creepy, and whenever mom asked me to go get her anything down there, I beat it up the stairs as quick as I could. I found the blankets hanging in the middle ceiling of the basement. It was not hanging there with any kind of fastener. One edge was just stuck flat on the side of the beams, the floor joist from the room above, with the rest of it dangling down. It looked like they put it there in plain sight to be sure I'd see it. I'd grab one corner, pull it down, and ran up the stairs. That was the only time I've personally experienced anything strange like that. I've heard many stories of unexplainable things from different people that I know. I remember once my roommate and her boyfriend were in our base in my apartment, and both of them heard what sounded like someone heavy in boots coming down the stairs, and knock on the door sharply three times. They thought it was the landlord, because he lived upstairs, and had the only other key to the outside door at the top of the stairs that was locked. They said just a minute, but got no answer. And when they opened the apartment door, no one was there. I don't normally tell these stories to anyone because they sound outlandish, but I'm a professional as an NBA in English, and I've had some of the strangest things happen to me. The most memorable one was in the fall of 1990. I was a senior in high school, and my boyfriend and I were out with our best friend. Being a stupid teenager, I was riding on my boyfriend's lap in the front seat because we were just going to the park, which was only about three miles from where we were, and we lived in the middle of no man's land. There was a forest of trees in the middle of the fork. We were talking and carrying on, and my friend, Mike, took the left fork instead of the right fork. I looked up, fussing at him for taking the wrong road. When we saw this guy in a gray sweatshirt and blue sweatpants walk out of the trees right in front of the car. Of course, I thought we were going to wreck, so I braced my arm on the dashboard and ducked my head, preparing to be thrown through the windshield. I was screaming, but I felt no impact. When I looked up, we were on the right road going towards the park, and there was no one in front of the car. Of course, we stopped the car and mulled around for a few minutes, trying to see if maybe someone had wrecked in the trees, but there was no sign of anything. I do know that about four years before that, my brother had a good friend who died at the intersection while running from the cops after a domestic dispute. He never made the turn and went straight into the trees. He left behind two small children. Maybe it was him trying to go home. My next experience happened with a Ouija board, and I can promise I'll never touch another one. We were trying to contact a friend who had passed away about a year earlier. I asked him the proof he was who he said, and he gave us some details that each of us in the room would know about him individually, but not collectively. I asked him the proof he was there. I heard something happening in the laundry room, and I threw the board into the hallway and went to look. All the cabinets above the washer and dryer were open, and all the storage sheets were laying all over the floor. My cat's food and water had been pushed to the opposite side of the room. It was too scary for all of us. We camped out together in sleeping bags on the floor, as close to one another as we could. And this is my final story because this one is happening presently. I had a daughter two years ago. I decided to pass on my middle name, which has been a family tradition for girls in our family for years, Grace. 
The wild thing is, my daughter was due on June 21st, which I thought was cool because it was my brother's birthday, but she was born on May 27th, 1996, exactly one year to the date of the death of my aunt Grace, whom I loved during life. She was my godmother, and she never had any kids, and I felt it was a meaningful tribute to her. Anyways, getting to my point, my daughter was born very sick, but became healthy very quickly. She has grown into a radiant little girl. We have moved five times since she was born, my job and me traveling, and we finally decided to settle near one set of my grandparents so she could have the loving support I never had. So we moved to Atlanta. The strange thing is, I've noticed that she always has the coldest room in the house. My husband makes a joke out of it, since he is always hot, that he doesn't know how we always do that. I believe it is my Aunt Grace watching over her, her guardian angel. I've been in her room, putting her to bed, reading her a story, and felt someone sit on the bed with us with a great thud. My aunt was no little woman, but always a beautiful one. The strangest thing that has happened recently is that an old makeup case with a camo on it, with the powder still in it, has appeared in my home. I know I did not get this from my mom because we do not speak. It sits in my bookcase. When my husband and I married, I decided to use her wedding band, but it causes blisters on my fingers and always appears in the jewelry box that I keep in my daughter's room. So now I know. My Aunt Grace wants my daughter to have it instead of me. I've always wondered what was going on in the house I grew up in. It was only 20 years old when we bought it. We knew the builders and had only one owner since then, an old woman who kept cats. My mother bought the house when I was four and from day one, I was terrified to be in there. It just felt wrong. It was a small house, only two bedrooms, all on one level with the exception of an attic and a basement. There were definitely sections of the house that felt safe and sections that did not. The back bedroom, the back bedroom closet, the bathroom, and the short steps and hallway leading to the back door and basement were not. The first bedroom, living room, and ironically enough, the kitchen. So as long as you put your eye on that back hall, were safe. The things that occurred in the house were experienced by the entire family, though my mother and older sister always had a reasonable explanation for that. Heavy breathing could often be heard. Mom's explanation, the swing set up the road creaking, footsteps across the ceiling, the neighbors. Now, our house sat alone and shared no walls. So how would we hear the neighbors going up their stairs, inside their house? Items that were set down would suddenly vanish, only to reappear after much frantic hunting. But worse than that was the feel. People were loath to do anything that would make a loud noise. Vacuuming, showering, flushing the toilet, frying food, anything that made a cover-up noise. It always made you want to spin around and run when you couldn't hear past the noise you were making, as if for allowing something to sneak up on you. When anyone went down to the basement, which housed the washer and dryer, they inevitably ran down the stairs. Those stairs, you just didn't want to be caught on them. My mom was a compulsive decorator, and the only spot in the house that did not boast ornamentation was the hall leading to the basement stairs. Even she couldn't bear to be in there long enough to hang a picture. Once in the basement, the person felt compelled to keep a running, shouted conversation with whomever was upstairs. You did not want to be cut off down there. Sleeping in this house was a nightmare. The overwhelming fear of shutting off the light and daring to sleep. Myself and my niece both experienced this 
In the back bedroom too, there was a closet. The closet door had a tendency to suddenly slam open. My mom's explanation, it was hung crooked. When I was 14, tired of it, I put a latch on it. Some years later, the door flung itself open, hard enough to send the latch flying through the opposite window. Hung crooked indeed. The most terrifying event in the house was experienced by myself, my niece, and my dog. We were sleeping, both in my room. My sister was asleep on the sofa, and my mom in her room. Jennifer and I were awakened by a voice from the area of the basement calling my name. I thought it was my sister and asked her what she wanted. I woke her up. It had not been her. I woke my mom up. It wasn't her either. While I was talking to my mother, the voice came again, telling me to come to it. My niece asked my mom if she had heard it, and my mother replied that she had heard nothing and that we were dreaming, both of us, dreaming the same dream. Okay. It went on all night, and my dog, guardian of my well-being, hid under the bed and whimpered. We lived in the house for 17 years. During that time, we had bedding switched from one bed to another, tapes and records moved under furniture, and perhaps the most puzzling, we came home daily for a week to find bowls of hot food and cups of steaming tea set out as though someone had just been there, yet the house was locked. We had a neighbor watch the house to make sure the kids weren't coming in, but nobody was seen to enter. To this day, whenever my niece or myself have a nightmare, it is set in that house. No dreams that take place in the house turn out to be good ones. I've actually had dreams that are going along fine until I realized where I was. I also remember having a dream that I was married and my husband had purchased a house. He took me to see our new house and you guessed it, it was for Harrison Court. In the dream, the most amazing wave of terror swept over me at the thought of stepping into the house again. We have no idea what was wrong with it. We know the woman who bought it from us and she still lives in it. My children and I had a very bad experience with a demon in a house that we lived in. My son became very scared one night as he viewed the ghost of a man with a sword sticking out of its side. This ghost was standing in the doorway of my son's bedroom very late one night. He said that this thing was just giving him the feeling of such terrible hatred and dread. It made my son feel like it was going to kill us. My son started sleeping in my daughter's bedroom, and that thing started going from room to room, looking for my son, and so it started coming into our room and scaring the daylights out of me. I had felt the hatred and anger. I know that it would have killed us if we had not gotten our pasture out there. When our pastor pulled into our drive, he said he felt the anger and hatred just emanating from the house to the outside. He knew what we were up against, and we immediately started saying prayers and his army of saints to fight for us. Ultimately, it worked. So while we were living there, we had no more problems. But whenever we drive by, we cannot even look at the house. Reading some of the stories that your readers have sent you brought back a memory I thought I had long forgotten, and I would like to share it with you. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, it did not occur to me, but instead happened to a childhood friend of mine. Being an ex-army brat, part of my childhood was spent in a suburb just east of St. Louis called Spanish Lake. It was called that for a lake that was near there, and a favorite hangout of many of the townspeople. A nice lake during the day, but at night, it was said that the ghost of a sunken Spanish galleon walked the shores of the lake, especially during the summer months, in search of what was unknown. 
At one time, I had been told that several people had simply disappeared from there and were never heard from again. Truth or not, I will not venture a guess. The lake was also said to have a section that was bottomless, and there, supposedly, lay the Spanish galleon. Being teenagers and fearing nothing, several of us used to go there with our girlfriends or boyfriends and park. But one night, my friend told me he had learned his lesson and would never, ever go there again. I came out of my house one summer's day in 1971, and I saw Randy up the street, absolutely throwing a fit, yelling, screaming, cursing, and in general, having the proverbial cow. He was standing near his car, a 1966 Plymouth Roadrunner, in mint condition, or at least, it almost was, now. Something you must understand is that this car was Randy's pride and joy. He babied the car, and it was one of the fastest car in the area at the time, as well as one of the sharpest looking cars. It was a painted metallic turquoise, and built to the hilt. I asked him what he was so pissed off about, and he showed me. What I saw scared the bejesus out of me. It looked as if someone, or something, had ran their fingers down the entire length of the passenger side of his car and completely melted the paint where they had touched the car. He told me that he and his girlfriend, the night before, had gone to their favorite spot on the lake to be alone. He told me that they had been there long enough to fog the windows a little, during a pause for breath catching or something. One of them looked out the front window, seeing what appeared to be a sort of red glow emanating from the lake itself. At first they tried to ignore it, their attention on each other, but unfortunately, they both became rather interested in it. Randy told me that within the glow, he started to make out what looked like a ball, just a little brighter than the glow itself. At this point, Randy told me that it appeared to start coming towards them. He told me that it looked like it was pulsing or something, almost as though it were alive. It came slowly towards them, and they got really scared. His girlfriend told him that she wanted to leave, right now. Randy told me that he tried to start the car, and absolutely nothing happened. Not one damn thing. It was almost as if all the power had been sucked from it. Meantime, the red glow continued towards them. He said his girlfriend became near hysterical, wanting to leave, but he told her that, try as he might, there was nothing he could do, and he was not about to get out of the car to find out either. All they could do was make sure the doors were locked, and the windows were up as far as they would go, and wait. He said that after a short time, the red glow completely surrounded them, and his car began a slow rocking motion at first. Then, without warning, Randy told me that the car began to rock more violently, and he said he and his girlfriend could hear a growling or something of the sort anyway. Then he told me that he could hear a scraping sound down the passenger side of his car. He said the best way he could describe the sound was like someone scraping their fingernails down a chalkboard. Randy said this went on for several more minutes. He wasn't sure for how long. And all he and his girlfriend could do was sit there and hold one another. She of course in tears and Randy very nearly there himself. Suddenly he said, the growling stopped, the scraping ceased, and the glow was gone. It simply wasn't there anymore. Shaking, he reached for the ignition switch and tried turning the key. He said the car started right away and they got the heck out of there, not looking back once, and were grateful when they were back up on the main road and heading into town. By the time Randy had been able to calm his girlfriend down and get her home, it was very late, so he decided to just go home and try to get some sleep but not before trying to see what kind of damage had been done. 
Randy told me that after he had gotten home, he went into the house, got his flashlight, and went back outside. He said that at the time, he saw absolutely nothing, and after very careful examination too. But the next morning, his brother had wakened him, wanting to know what happened to his baby. That's when he discovered what he had. He tried several times after to fix the problem, but within a few days, the fingerprints would reappear, just as if they were fresh. Shortly after that, I left Spanish Lake. I was told that Randy eventually got rid of his car, and I heard nothing more of it. But to be honest with you, I've not been too awfully curious either. When I was about 13 years old, I used to babysit quite a lot in my neighborhood. Back then, I didn't believe in ghosts or the paranormal. I lived in upstate New Jersey at the time. My foster family had recently moved into a new housing development in a small suburban town near the New York state border. The house next door to us was an old farmhouse. The housing development had been built on what had been the farm. The farmhouse had supposedly been built during the mid to late 1700s. When I came home from a babysitting job late one night, I looked out at the window for several minutes at the stars, trying to find a different constellations, as was my habit just about every night. Then, I saw a ball of mist, which appeared to be walking down the middle of the road. I thought that it must be some kind of gas or water vapor, although I'd never seen anything like it in my life. It seemed so deliberate. It never veered from the road. I watched it go to the end of the block and make a right into the woods that led to New York State. It was weird, but I figured that there must be some rational explanation for it. The couple who had just moved into the old farmhouse needed a babysitter for a Saturday night for their four-year-old daughter. I agreed to babysit. I arrived at the couple's house about 7 p.m on a hot summer night. As soon as I entered their house, their Doberman Pinscher ran up to me and started barking at me and howling. He wouldn't stop regardless of what the couple tried to do. His howls became shrill and he began to growl at me. I'd never been afraid of animals as I'd grown up around dogs and I like animals very much. This dog really scared me just the same. The husband put the dog down in the garage, where it finally stopped howling. I met the little girl, and then the mother put her to bed in her upstairs bedroom. When the couple left, I turned on the TV. Despite the hot night, there was not even as much as a fan in the house, yet the house was comfortably cool. At about 10 or 11 p.m. that night, the TV began to have interference, and the lights dimmed noticeably. The television began to get so much interference that it became impossible to watch. The lights dimmed even more. I thought that there must be something wrong with electrical wiring in the old house. I sat by the light and began to read. The house was becoming cooler. Despite the hot night outside, this house was becoming cold. There was an afghan on the back of the couch, which I wrapped around me. I went to the window, wondering why it was suddenly becoming cold. The window pane was warm. It was certainly warmer than the house was at the moment. I tried to open the window to let the warm air in, but I could not budge any of the windows. The outside world looked so strange from inside the house, as though you were looking at something far away or looking at a picture of something rather than reality. Then I began to hear what sounded like a light footfall at the top of the stairs. I could only hear them coming down, but not up, on about the top one third of the stairway. I looked to see if this little girl had gotten up, but she was sound asleep with her sheet tucked in around her. As I sat reading, the footfall became closer and got louder. I stood by the stairway and watched. I saw nothing, but could still hear the footfall. 
I thought that this old house must be still settling to be making all this noise. Then, the footfalls began a pounding and seemed to reach the end of the stairwell. They were closer together, loud and insistent, but always, always, only descending the staircase, never ascending it. Then, I heard a loud bang from the room, directly in line with the stairway at the top. I raced to the room, thinking that I might find a little girl there, or a small animal which might have gotten into the house and knocked something over. I turned on the light to the room. The room was very cold, and the light was very dim. The child was not there, and nothing was out of place. I recalled promptly from the small frigid room. The hairs at the back of my neck were standing up, and I felt a strange sensation as though a current of electricity was coursing through my spine to the base of my skull. I checked on the little girl who was sound asleep despite the racket and still tuck her snuggling into her bed. At this point, I was getting scared but figured that there must be some rational explanation for what was happening. The footsteps continued their pounding but now they descended all the way to the foyer. There was a deep shack carpet runner along the foyer. I could hear creaking floorboards beneath it and indentations in the carpet as though someone were pacing on it. I thought that there must be some really small animal on the carpet and decided to try to catch it. I planted myself in the middle of the carpet when something came over me. Everything went dark for a second. I felt as though someone had thrown something over my head, and for a few seconds, I couldn't breathe. This was no small animal. I was petrified. I ran up the stairs to check the child, and she was still fast asleep. After the incident on the carpet, the foothills started making their way up the staircase. It was like a playback of what had been going on most of the night, only in reverse. By the time the foothills reached the top third of the stairwell, they'd stopped the incessant pounding and were only slightly stepping, yet still only descending the stairway. Finally, they disappeared entirely. The lights resumed their brightness and the television was no longer bothered by the interference. By this time, it was about 2 a.m. and the stairwalking had gone on for several hours. All through this, there had been not one peep from the dog in the garage. The couple returned home about 4 a.m. They asked me if everything had been alright. I had felt as though I had been losing my mind. I just told them that everything had been okay. The next day, my foster sister made a point of asking me, how did the babysitting go? I told her, the house is really weird. Then she told me, I didn't want to tell you before you went babysitting because I didn't want to scare you. She proceeded to tell me that the former owners had told her that the house was haunted. They told her that all the members of the family had seen the ghost many times. They explained that one of the original owners of the house, a Mr. H, had committed suicide by hanging himself from the attic door which was directly above the top landing of the stairwell. They had taken my sister for a tour of the house. When they had been renovating the house, they had discovered that the house beams and studs had been joined together by wooden pegs and not nails. This was a very old construction technique that was used because making wooden pages was easier than having to make nails. They took my foster sister for a tour of the cellar, which consisted of a maze-like collection of windowless cubicles. In each of the cubicles were manacles for hands and feet. Had Mr. H bought slaves to use as farm workers? In that area, the growing season is short and the winters are long and cold. Buying slaves would hardly have been cost effective for such a short period of time. Long ago, the land there had belonged to the Rampo Indians. Had Mr. H taken these people as seasonal slaves and dispensed with them after harvest time? 
My friends went down to the town city hall to check the records of the house. The records show that the house was considerably newer than had been thought about mid-19th century. This was after the slavery had been discontinued in the Northeast. The former owners of the house, who were also builders and renovators of old houses, said that the mode of construction that was used in the house would date the house as being much older. I guess we'll never know who was kept manacled in those airless little rooms in the cellar. We'll never know why Mr. H was driven to suicide, or if his death was indeed a suicide. Was the ghost that of Mr. H, or of someone else? Perhaps there is more than one tormented spirit in that troubled household. I'm from a very small town in Madison Parish, Louisiana. One cold February night, my five sisters and I were going to visit my dad's brothers, as was a habit of ours to do. A couple of times during the week, my father had a work van in which the motor was encased on the inside of the van. Since it only had a driver's seat and a passenger seat, some of us had to sit on top of the motor case. This night, in particular, we took a different route to our uncle's home for some reason unknown. As we turned onto a side street, only one of my other sisters and I saw a woman with long flowing brown hair down to her waist in a long flowing white nightgown glide across the street about one or two blocks ahead of us. My sister and both looked at each other at the same time and said, did you see that? One second she was to our left and the next she was across the street and then just vanished. When we got home later that night, I told my mother what my sister and I had seen. She said that many, many years ago. I'm not sure if it was in the early 1900s. A young lady who lived in that area was to be married. On her wedding night, her fiancé was tragically killed before the wedding could take place. The bride, who was very much in love with her fiancé, pined away and died from the grief of her loss. My mother said that my sister and I were not the only ones who had seen this lady. I will never forget the apparition that I saw that night, and I truly believe that what I saw was a ghost from the past. I suppose that every kid imagines a monster in a closet or under the bed at one time or another, and I had in fact began to believe my experience to be the result of a young fertile imagination. You see, my room was located in the basement of my parents' home. Located next to the basement stairs, my closet ran under the stair and had only an open doorway, no door. As I lay trying to sleep at night, I was sure I could discern a pair of glowing red eyes staring at me from the closet doorway. This always filled me with a sense of fear and trepidation. I could never quite make out the body of the apparition, more like having an idea of the shape and size, but never really seeing it. I also had the strange feeling that the apparition indeed wished me ill. Furthermore, there was some force that restricted it to the closet. However, as I said, I'd begun to doubt the evidence of my own experience. Until years after I'd left the family home, my cousin came to stay with my mom and dad due to family difficulties. She stayed in my former room. Mom informed me that she was having trouble sleeping. However, she could not seem to get her to give any reason as to her apparent insomnia. My mother asked me to talk to her Fearing her difficulties stemmed from the problems in the family. She further believed that being closer in age might make it easier for her to open up. She described to me exactly the same manifestation I had imagined when I slept in that room. After her room change, she was once again able to sleep comfortably at night.
My friend Christy is engaged to this guy named Sean. Sean has lived for most of his life at his parents' house in Cincinnati, Ohio. Sean's house is very old and just happens to be in a development that is situated over an old Indian burial ground. For as long as Sean can remember, there has been a ghost in the house. It imitates the voices of people who live in the house. There are many instances of Sean or his sisters being alone in the house and hearing one of their parents begging for help downstairs, only to go to the parent's aid and discover that the parent is not in the house. Sean even recorded it once while he was recording himself playing drums. In addition, there is a spirit that follows them and visitors around the house. It is a tall dark figure wearing a hooded cloak. It has never harmed anyone, but merely made them feel uncomfortable. About a year ago, Christy made a trip out to Cincinnati to meet Sean's parents for the first time. He didn't want to tell her about the house because he didn't want to spook her. Sean's parents invited her to stay in the guest room and Christy accepted. The first night of the visit, Christy was sound asleep when she woke up suddenly and felt something icy slide over her and felt like something was watching her. She got spooked and went over to the Sean's room and slid into bed with him and stayed there for the rest of the night. Sean didn't tell her at the time, but the hooded figure followed her into the room. The same thing happened the next night, and Sean finally told her. She refused to stay in the house another night. When I was about four or five, maybe even younger, I remember one night I was sleeping in my room and I awoke. I don't know why I did. I may have been dreaming. Anyways, I looked ahead of me to my wall and there was a face on it. It was blue, looked human, and this may sound strange, but I had a hat on that looked like one of those Arabian towels that they wrapped their heads with. It spoke to me. I don't remember what it said, but oddly, I wasn't afraid of it. I don't remember the reaction, but I asked my mom if she remembered about when I told her there recently, and she said I used to tell her about a lady in blue visiting me quite often. I only remember telling her about my only experience once. I might have seen the face more than I remember. I don't think it was a dream because I don't think I would remember a dream I had when I was 5 or younger. I'm 15 now, so it was at least 10 or more years ago. That's my experience. If anyone has had an experience similar to mine, please write me about it. I've only had one paranormal experience. It happened last October when my boyfriend had temporarily rented a trailer. We had lived there for almost two months and nothing out of the ordinary had happened. One afternoon, he decided to take a nap and I was in the living room watching TV. I started hearing this really strange continuous screeching noise. It sounded like it was coming from inside the wall beside his bedroom door. When I walked over there, it stopped. I sat back down and started watching TV again, and it started back again. This time, I walked into the kitchen, the bedroom was right beside the kitchen, and I started opening the bottom cabinets, and once again, the screeching stopped. I never said anything about it to my boyfriend, because I didn't think about it at the time. A couple of days later, we were in the kitchen eating breakfast and he told me that the day before, when he was there by himself, that he had heard a weird, loud, screeching noise. He said he tried to find where it was coming from, and it would stop when he'd look. I told him that the same thing had happened to me while he was asleep a few days earlier. We both talked about ghosts and laughed about it, pretty much dismissing it as a joke. A few nights later, 
His mom came and stayed the whole night and was asleep on the living room couch. This particular night, we were sleeping in the bedroom on the opposite end of the trailer. It was really late, probably around 3 a.m., and we had been laying there talking when I started hearing this noise. It was kind of like the screeching, but much quieter and screeched in intervals like footsteps. I thought my boyfriend had dropped over the side of the bed, making that noise with his hand against the plastic on the mattress. I said, Brian, quit making that noise. He said, I'm not making that noise, and held up both of his hands. He looked at me as scared as I looked back at him, and he said, get up and get dressed. As soon as he said that, you could actually tell where the screeching was moving through the room to the corner beside the bed and feel this undiscernible presence. And all of a sudden, the screeching just went crazy and so loud. It was right there. Needless to say, within a split second, it was the only one there. Now you can imagine two grown adults running into the living room to wake up his mom. She said she hadn't heard anything, but that we had scared her to death running through the living room at 3 a.m. in the morning like we were on fire. We sat up in the living room for the rest of the night and moved back to my mom's house within the week. So far, that's the only experience that I've had. For a while now, my sister has lived in a house a few blocks away from my parents' house. I live with my parents. I would go over there to babysit my nephew when my sister had plans. Some nights I would sleep over there. Her house always had a creepy feeling to it, a thick feeling to the air. My sister had just had knee surgery and wasn't able to take care of her son, so I was spending the weekend over there. The first couple of nights were fine, I didn't mind at all, but the last night I stayed there. I was in the living room watching TV when I caught something out of the corner of my eye. It looked like a shadow. Before I say any more, I better tell you the layout of my sister's house. When you walk in, you go to the left and down a hallway. The open doorway to the left leads to the kitchen. The kitchen has another entry as well. The first door on the left is my sister's bedroom. The only door on the right is the bathroom, and the door at the other end of the hallway belongs to my eldest sister, when she's there that is. On the other side of the kitchen is a set of French glass doors and let out into a game room, an add-on to the house. The doors are always kept closed and locked at night. The only people in the house that night were myself, my sister, the one on the mat, and her son. So anyway, I saw a shadow. At first I thought maybe it was my sister getting up to ask me to get her something. But the shadow simply vanished before I could get a closer look at it. I shrugged it off as me being tired. I lay down to go to sleep. I woke up a couple minutes later. It was around 5 in the morning. I didn't know what had woken me. I was sweating badly and I felt like someone was sitting on my chest. I was propped up enough to see the French doors, which were across the room from the sofa. What I saw that night is engraved into my brain. There was an old woman outside the doors. She had her hands pressed against two of the glass panels and her face against another. Her mouth was open in a scream. I was scared beyond belief. Because I couldn't move, I couldn't speak, I couldn't do nothing but lay there. And then the door began rattling. The woman was shaking it. A shadow came out of the kitchen, and the woman vanished. The shadow vanished after that, and I could breathe again. I don't know what the shadow was, but it did make the woman go away. I like to think it was my guardian angel. Who knows? That's my story. Anyway, and yeah, 
it is true. My mother was born in Austria-Hungary in 1908. When her parents immigrated to the US, they left their three children behind in the care of their grandparents. It was five years until her parents were able to return and bring the children to the US. In that five years, my mother became very close to her grandfather and went everywhere with him. She arrived in the US as a 13 year old, grew up and married my father. They were a young farm couple living in rural Ohio. One night, my mother awoke to see her grandfather standing at the foot of her bed. He was smiling at her, but did not speak. She relayed that she pulled the covers over her head and then looked again, and he was still there. She then tried to wake my father, but when he awoke, her grandfather disappeared. She had the overwhelming feeling that her grandfather had died. This happened in the mid-1920s, and at that time, international long distance was only a thing for wealthy folks. Her only contact with her grandparents was via mail, which would take a couple of weeks to arrive. Sure enough, two weeks later, she received a letter from her grandmother verifying that her grandfather had passed away on the same day and approximately the same time that he appeared in her bedroom. My father attested to the entire happening. This was always our family ghost story that no one ever had a reason to doubt. My parents live on a farm in Sugar Grove. My stepdad grew up here with his family as a child. On Christmas Eve in 1964, his dad went into town to pick up the grandma for the holiday. With him, he took a younger daughter and his younger son. On the way home, there was a terrible accident and everybody died except the daughter. Over the years, the farmhouse was used as rental property until my mom met her husband. They have lived here now for six years and have had many experiences with the spirits of this home. I too have had some of the same. There are many, many voices that we hear. Marbles rolling down the hallway upstairs, foot noises walking up and down the stairway, clouds of light and dark smoke throughout the entire house, doors open and close, things come up missing, then are returned within days. If you are alone in the house and stand by the sink, you will soon hear a voice that asks you to go away. It will repeat until you walk away from the sink. Standing outside, if you look up into the window upstairs, sometimes you will see a vision of a woman standing in the window. This is believed to be Grandma. I have an 11 year old daughter that has walked into the downstairs bathroom and ran out stating there is a man standing at the bathroom sink. He will only turn his head and look at you and then turn back to the mirror. He hasn't spoken yet. When my parents first came here, they slept upstairs. They had to move to the downstairs room in the winter because no matter what room you are in up there, it is ice cold. We have used electric heat sources to try to generate heat, but it doesn't work. There are also apparitions of faces, white in color, etched into the door of the master bedroom. These appear darker at times and lighter at other times. They appear to be stuck in the wood of the door. It's believed by everyone here that the spirits and happenings of this house are all those family members that were killed in the crash. After all, they all did reside here, and I think they still do. My mother passed away a little over four years ago. Since then, we have seen her, usually in dreams, and my father has actually seen her many times in her home. My mother had been sick with a congestive heart failure that took a turn for the worst 
for about two years. My dad cared for her day and night. Finally, the last trip to the hospital was supposed to be a routine trip to remove excess fluid. On the way to the hospital, my mother made a prophetic statement to her that she would not be coming home again. When she was given the diagnosis that no further help was available to her, and she would be sent home with hospice, she refused and decided to die in the hospital instead of at home because my father had to continue to live there and she did not want him to find it hard to stay at their home. Nine days of excruciating pain from a failing liver and kidneys and unable to get her breath, she succumbed to death only after the last of her immediate family visited her on that day. It was as if she had waited until she had seen her husband, children, grandchildren, and son-in-laws before she was ready to go. Ten minutes after the last visitor, she breathed her last. Oddly enough, the grandfather clock at my parents' home stopped at the exact time of her death. My father has refused to rewind it. After 60 years of marriage, my father has been so lost. For the first year, she appeared to him frequently with a smile on her face, and one time told him, I love you deeply and just want to make sure you are okay. She still appears to him, just not as frequently as the first year. Recently, my sister and father had found a picture she had painted and had a frame to give me for my birthday. My dad saw my mother the morning they gave me the gift and said she was holding a shopping bag with a wooden frame sticking out from it with a huge smile on her face. He said they communicated without talking and he knew she was happy and proud I was getting the picture. I've seen my mother in dreams but only one stands out as a possible contact with her. In my dream, I was looking through the picture window of my parents' home and saw her sitting in her chair with my father standing over her, talking and smiling as if he was catching up on recent events. I went inside the house and she looked at me and smiled. I remember how peaceful she looked and so healthy. I remember saying, Mama, how can this be? I saw you in the casket at the funeral home. She just smiled at me and said, Well, sometimes these things just happened. I replied, Well, I don't care how it happened. I'm glad to have you back. I've missed you. With that, I woke up. One other time. After an extremely frustrating day, I was walking in a corridor and thought I'd heard her call my name. She said, Susie. I actually said out loud, Mama? She was not even there. My sister says she has dreamed of her, but never actually have seen her. My son slept in my mom's bed about six months after her passing and said sometimes in the night, he felt her sit down on the side of the bed. He knew it was her because he could smell her perfume. My nephew recalled a dream he had the first Thanksgiving holiday after her passing. He said that in his dream, he walked out of his upstairs bedroom and she was in the hallway. He said, let's go get some turkey granny. He said she replied, now Mark, you know I can't go downstairs with you this year, but you know I'm here. My family feels that she is around us all the time. I know she is with my father the most because he is terminally ill and misses her so terribly. I feel comforted knowing she is waiting for his time to cross over. My mother is a current janitor working at Rockford College, and one of the buildings she is assigned to cleans happens to be the Burpee building. There, she and some of the other ladies that work with her have lunch in that specific building every work night. A while back, 
She told us that during her lunch break, she saw what was a female figure walk past the room they were in. She said she wore a blue dress and had blonde hair. The room has a mirror that faced the only door of the small area. She said, and I quote, I glanced at the mirror, a habit of doing when you're in that room a lot, and saw this thin, transparent figure walk past the door. I thought it was one of the other girls that was walking by, but it wasn't until I realized that no one that night was wearing a blue dress or had dyed their hair blonde. I walked out to see if it was a trespasser, but saw no one in the hall. I called security and asked them if they allowed any blonde, blue-dressed girl on the property. They denied doing so, confirming my suspicions that it was possibly a ghost. This is just one of the stories that she has told us during the last two years of her encounters with the burpy ghosts. This just happened to me just recently, on February 8th, 2008, when I took a ghost tour of the Tuang Cemetery in Brisbane, Australia. First of all, I would like to keep this to myself anonymous. Secondly, what I saw is true, for I did some research to see if anyone else experienced what I saw that night, and, as it turns out, a few people over the years saw it too. It was cold and partly windy that night when I turned up at the ghost of the Chewing Boneyard, Brisbane's oldest and biggest graveyard. There's a lot of strange stories connected to this boneyard, like a vampire. There's only two boneyards in the world that got fair dinkham vampires, Highgate in London and Chewing in Brisbane. The Bleeding Grave and Walking Statue. Yes, a wandering statue. Anyway, the tour barely began as our hostess was introducing herself when I saw something standing amongst the trees. It was solid and black. It was standing there watching us. I saw it, but I thought I was seeing things. Excitement that might have sparked off my imagination. But as I walked past the spot, there was nothing there to resemble that figure. But yet it was real, as you and I wasn't until a few feet ahead, I heard a weird clang sound right next to me, as if someone was banging in a pot or whatever. I thought it was the signpost rattling, but there was no signpost anywhere. Now that was freaking weird. I thought, as I hurried on, looking behind me, most of the night I felt we were being followed by something, as I was Till and Charlie best place to be on a ghost tour at the end of the line. Things started to get a bit stranger, like the cold wind I felt touching me if there was no wind blowing. The same thing happened again two nights later, when I felt something touching my neck in my own home, or seeing things at the corner of my eyes. When I turn around, there will be nothing there. I thought I was ready for the madhouse at one point. I know that I saw something, so I researched it, and as it turned out, others saw that same black figure at the same spot where I saw him or her, whatever the heck it was, and heard the same clanging sound I heard, so I didn't imagine it at all. I hope I didn't. That's my story. I've got other great spine-chilling tales, which I'll put up ASAP. But this was the first experience I had in years, except for the ghost of my dog who came back for a few nights to bark goodbye to us. My name is Tina, I'm 33, and I have a story I would like to share with you and your readers. I've been experiencing strange things for many years now, but I've only been sharing them for just a few people who don't believe always have the need to find something wrong with the ones who do. My mom was one of those people. She would roll her eyes and say I was crazy or I had been drinking. The day she became a believer was one of the most beautiful moments we've ever shared. 
This is our story. My mom had surgery in her foot and was using a walker to get around. I was at her house helping her with her laundry and such, and had laid my son down in the bedroom down the hall for his nap. Mom was kicked back in the recliner and decided she would also take a nap. All my chores were done for the time. Everybody in the house was sleeping, so I went out to get into the pool. I turned on the baby monitor at the room where my son was sleeping and brought the other piece outside with me. My mom lives out in the country. No neighbors close enough for monitor to pick up any other signals from a phone or another baby monitor. It was so quiet in my mom's house, I could hear the tick-tock ticking of the clock in the room where the monitor was. All of a sudden, I heard a woman's voice so clear and loud. It sounded like she was speaking into the monitor. It sounded like peep, as in P-E-E-P. -E -E I'm not sure what that means. Maybe it was just gibberish. That's what I heard. At this point, I start to run to the door to see if my mom is still in the chair in the living room. I got to the door, snatched it open, and there was my mom, still reclined back in the chair with a really strange look on her face. I guess I had a strange look on my face too, because she said, what? What's the matter? Who's here? Who are you talking to? I just looked at her and couldn't say anything. She asked again who I was talking to, and I said, nobody. Why? She said that she heard a woman talking, and she thought she was dreaming. She opened her eyes, and the woman was still talking, so she knew she wasn't dreaming. Having to always have an explanation for things, she then assumed I was on the phone, but looked around and saw the phone and my cell phone were on the kitchen counter. That was when I came in the door, and she knew it wasn't me. I said, you heard that too? Yes, she said, with a very strange look on her face. So I went down to the hall to the room where my son was still sleeping, and looked around. Nothing out of the ordinary, nothing out of place. I came back down the hall and told my mom he was fine, still sleeping, hadn't moved an inch. She was a little freaked out, but she started asking me questions about my great-grandmother, who often visits me in the places that I go. I never met my great-grandmother in person, but I've had many run-ins with her spirit. My mom didn't want to believe that grandma visits her too, but after that day, she started to believe, not only in ghosts and spirits, but in me too. Thanks, Grandma Daisy. Wait a second before you shut the phone off. Can I get a like, a subscribe, and a share? Let me know you got to the end of this video by saying you got to the end of the video. Or you can say really anything because it really helps the algorithm grow. Let's get the 40,000 subscribers because it would just help me tremendously. And uh, we're going to have a long video. This is the short video. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you're subscribed, welcome. If you're going to subscribe, well, I appreciate that because I think you need to. And uh, we got a lot of fun coming. Uh, you know, it's summer. It's the middle of a heat wave. Did you guys enjoy the heat wave? I hope not uh, because it's, you know, not something you enjoy. Anyway, I uh, love you and I'll see you in the next video. I'll cut this short.